effectual. I'm going to show you what they're doing to us, so we have to understand what they're doing to us, so we can put up a defense that we can take the corruption away from the judge. See, the judges, they're corrupt, but we're allowing it. We're telling them, we want you to be corrupt. I don't have to file property taxes, yes? Hey, Carrie, a smoking baby here. We had a... uh... Smoking baby, I love it. On the, um, we had a woman that was going through foreclosure, and on on the titles of my property or the deeds or the warranty deed, or, I mean, or the uh, mortgage deed, there's two or three descriptors that describe what what they say the property is, and two that are always there is the mailing address and the parcel ID are on the deed, and the third one may be a, a meets and bounds description, but I'm talking about the first two. The uh-huh. I wrote to the I wrote to the U.S. Postal Service and asked them. I, I'm a contractor, so I move all over the country. So I have all these mailing addresses on my credit report. So I wrote to the post office and asked them, "Who owns the mailing address?" The local director in, in L.A. County wrote back and says the mailing addresses belong to the municipality. So what we did with this woman was we took her, we took the mailing address and returned it to the city. That's on the hmm. mailing address on the deed. We returned it to the city, quick claimed it back to the city by special deposit. And then we took the parcel ID, which belongs to the county, which is a fictional overlay on top of the, on top of the land meets and bounds. When we went to the post office, and we took the name on the deed, which is a unregistered fictitious business entity. So we made a fictitious business entity name DBA for the name on the deed. It was Mrs. Smith, comma single woman. And we did a fictitious business name on the deed and took that fictitious business name to the post office, filled out a, a P.O. box application in the name of the fictitious business name. And then for, we put the mailing address and the parcel ID as the address for that P.O. box. Then we notified the county that they can find their parcel ID at the post office. The sheriff later came out, stood at the side, stood at the edge of the sidewalk where the property begins, and asked the woman, "Hey, can we come out and talk to you?" And she says, "I have nothing to say to you," which is silly. But the sheriff would not cross the line. The electric meter reader guy came to the property, knocked on the door, and he said, "Do you mind if I go around and read your meter?" And he, she says, "You've never done that before." I said, "Well, my boss told me now I have to get permission to go and read the meter." The, the mailing address, the mailing address, and the parcel ID are easements on that on that title to that property. So we threw off those two easements, and then we had to go place the meets and bounds, which they do not control the land, and put the meets and bounds, and refiled an amended deed, and the foreclosure never happened. We threw off the easements. There was a guy in Australia who had his property uh, foreclosed on from Pricewaterhouse Coopers down there. It's crazy down there. But when Pricewaterhouse Coopers wrote the guy a letter of their intent to foreclose, they said the property to be foreclosed, and they put, quote, his mailing address, in quotes, they're foreclosing on the mailing address that does not belong to him, that describes his property. Yep, see, see, what we're doing, I love that, see, what we're doing is we're taking on the responsibility because I think, it don't matter what you think, I could care less. And smoking baby, I love, every time you cook it, I love your stuff, it's really good. Um, I'll be sending you an email. Please do. I'm loving this. If anybody has a question, we got the man right now on the phone. Ask, you know, if he doesn't mind, uh, come on and ask Wilkin, maybe. If you have a question, he'll be, I'm sure he, he'll answer it. Uh, well, I'm just giving you what I know. My, my expertise is not all that stuff. My, my expertise is what is the taxes and Okay, Ed, can you can you hit star six on that, please? Override. Thank you. But smoking baby, I love that because we got a lot of foreclosures up. Maybe you we, you can help us stop. Thank you so so much. If you don't mind giving me an email on that, I would love that. Well, it's not it's besides not. the foreclosure. Besides the foreclosure, they have the they have the claim to claim all the credit back, which we talked about using the W four and assessing the taxes for. And there's three different parts of that W four process with a mortgage on the property. Even for a lease, a lease is a security instrument, and there's an equitable right of redemption in any in any lease as well. All right. See now, there you go. And see, and it tells. How can I get out on it, uh, uh, baby? Yeah. It's smoking baby. How can we get in touch with you? Yeah, how can we do that? <laughs> um, a can of worms here. Let me, let me, 
Let me come up with a way, and I'll, I'll, I'll get that back okay. to people. Yeah, if okay. you don't mind, it, get it to me, and I'll I get it to I have a probate question. Okay. Can you hear me? What, what about probate? I certainly can. Probate? Yes, probate. Um, I was wondering about the deceased dates. I think I've sent a couple of packages to probate, probate and uh, and I was trying to see like what it, they keep coming back and asking me about the t decedent date. The decedent for for you or for a really dead, a really really dead or a merely merely dead person? For me, a non citizen. It would be the date the original birth certificate hit the book of life. The original record, the original recordation date in the book. Of, the recordation date of the original birth certificate that was recorded in the book of life at the vital record. That would be so the file date. Yeah, that's what I was asking. Would it be the file date or would it be the actual date? Because I put the file date in and then they sent it back. What file date? The uh, date it was in the book of life. Um, the file date is the date that the registrar signed off on it. No, that's that's when the registrar signed off. But there's a subsequent date in the Book of Life. You need to go to the Vital Records and ask to see the Book of Life. Have you done your name change yet? I have. Well, when you go back in with that decree, you have ask the ask the uh, ask the registrar to get a copy of. There's three there's three registries per page in the Book of Life. Ask to see your particular piece. Have it printed out and find the uh, original. Uh, the original file date in the Book of Life. The other ones were just transfer dates. And, uh, okay, I'm just making notes. So There's you said go more. back in. I'm sorry. Go to, the, go to the vital records with your with your uh, name decree. Ask the uh, red, the vital records lady and the birth certificate, birth certificate amendment office. That's what it's called. Have her add your new name to the Book of Life and and have her give a copy of your record in the Book of Life. And then there's a there'll be an original file date in the in the in the book of life, and that's the de that's when the person became deceased before you got the name change. That's that's when it was marked down as dead. Okay, got you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Number I'm two. Um, okay. Number two. Uh, not next question, but um, so in the um, federal jurisdiction for um, for the tax court. I have um, a, I, I don't have a claim in. I have a petition in. This was my second petition. The first petition I didn't answer to. The second petition they came back and tried to dismiss, but they also told me about the a penalty file of twenty five thousand for um for frivolous Five. filing fees. Mm -hmm. Did you get a previous order? I did, did get, get a previous, previous dismiss. I did. No. And, and what did the order say? It said that it was dismissed for, um, oh my God, I don't have any fun. Lack of jurisdiction. Um, yes. And no, okay. it didn't say lack of jurisdiction. I was trying to get it to say lack of jurisdiction. So I got the second one that they tried to dismiss, and I went back in when they tried to dismiss it and put in a motion to dismiss for lack of jurisdiction. But they haven't answered me. Well, what, what was the first, what was the first dismissal? The first dismissal Maybe. was like I didn't answer. No, oh, you didn't answer. Okay. Oh, that, that's a, that's a different. I have to see what your documents were. Gary would have to see the documents are so we can. You, I mean, it's always open. You can go back and answer. <laughs> Most for reconsideration. Motion of reconsideration. Mm -hmm. Let me just put that. I, I just want to write notes. Motion. They, they, claimed, they, claimed, they claimed you did a non proc. Is that what they did? <laughs> they, they, it was very vague because they did it twice. I did it last year and then I did it that's this it, year. Sorry. They never assigned counsel, because they never assigned a counsel to it because I didn't move the case. They just dismissed it. Well, accept their accept their order. Agree with them. Okay, okay. I agree. It's dismissed for lack of jurisdiction. <laughs> accept the order. <laughs> yep. An order is an offer. An order is an offer. Until I accept the offer, we don't have a, an agreement between the parties. So that's when I did my consent decree. I accepted their offer, and it, and it settled the matter. Thank you. Smoking baby. I should. That's right. I'm, I'm, I'm smoking. I love the guy. Yeah. No, he's a baby and he's smoking. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm still listening, but I'm gonna get off so someone else can answer, ask a question. But thank you.
Smoking baby, can I ask you a question? Go ahead. Yes. Uh, just when you get the, the court dismisses it for failure to, state, failure to state a claim upon which relief can be granted, what's the current response to that? I, I haven't been able to catch these calls. And, and, okay. In, in order for the court to do a 12B6 uh, dismissal for um, failure to state a claim, the court is agreeing with you saying there is no claim because everything... In order to do a 12B6, everything in the complaint of a petition must be taken as true. There's cases on that. So the judge is essentially saying, um, I, the judge is coming off the bench as a trustee and saying, everything in your petition is true. So I just went ahead and did a consent decree based on a DOG, DOJ format, which I can get to carry. And based on the DOJ format, I put the... Uh, I put down the case that says everything's taken as true, wrote up my own order and wrote up my own final determination that there was, um, the respondent failed to, failed to do the uh, assessment or determination for those years and filed it and the court accepted it and I got a certified copy and that, and that solidified the agreement between me and the commissioner and now we're friends. And now I'm going back into the tax court and coming in, ex rel the commissioner as relator, I'm coming in as the commissioner and going after every single name and numbered account that's being administered by some corporation to assess the unpaid transfer taxes under Title 26, 2603, and using the tax court subpoena to force them to give me the accounting because they wanted $1,800 from U.S. Bank, $1,600 from Bank of America to get the accounting, and other companies won't give me the QSET number or overhead rate for my employment. So I'm going to go back in as the commissioner and assess the 2603 transfer tax, taxable termination tax, and or skip person transfer or taxes, and 2603 says who's liable for the tax. But I did the petition kit that Carrie brilliantly came up with is what I use to show that I'm not the tax debtor, I'm the tax creditor, and now I get to go back in and assess the, the uh, transfer taxes of all the credit transferred to these corporations or, or a foreclosure or foreclosure on a house or a, a uh, taking a car back. And now I get to assess the taxes of the value of that estate and for recoupment. So the consent decree, if they issue an order, agree with their order. I, okay, I agree with you and that there's and write up your own consent decree. Now there's a settlement of the of the controversy. An order is just hanging out there. It's not settled yet. Okay. So well, that's basically this thing's in flux until I respond to them somehow. Until, there you, until, you, yeah. until you agree with them. Yeah. So, but I have to go back and basically say they're saying that everything I said is done, so I need a dismissal that's for great. lack of jurisdiction. No, you no, no. You already have the lack of jurisdiction. You just agree with them. I agree with the court that everything on my petition is true, and the final determination is that the respondent never filed a notice of assessment for these for these years or a notice of determination for collection for these years. Agree with them. Yeah. Yeah, and I wish I could write as fast as you can speak, but I can't. It's recorded. It's recorded. I'll get the uh, DOJ. For, I'll get I'll get the DOJ format to carry and get them to Bowman. Or maybe I'll send it to both of them. And what I use for the uh, format for the consent decree. I also okay, I also I also subscribe to TIGTA, T I G T A. They send 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 out memorandums all the time. And I read the memorandums and the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration hand out all kinds of nuggets in there, what the IRS is supposed to do, and, and uh, it scolds them or gives new directions. So TICTA.gov, and there's a subscription page, and I subscribe to that, and there's old memorandums in there. Like the recent one said that the uh, Internal Revenue Service has to comply with Title 15 and they and little particular ones that the IRS has Can to you repeat by. that site? Can you repeat the website? TIGTA, T-I-G-T-A dot gov. Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration. Thank you. Yeah, well, I wish I, I want to go back and hear this again because I'd like to write that all down. I, I don't understand it as thoroughly as you do. I wish I did, but I don't. So I need to be able to find a way to get this knowledge by the Bible, it says, the Bible says to agree with your adversary when you're on the way. So the judge orders it. I agree with him. Um, so, I mean, even even during this little pandemic thing, when they when Walmart ordered me to wear a mask, 
because of their policy. I said, oh, in my brain, I said, I'm a de facto employee. They want goods and services from me, so I charge them $5,000 for a mouth mask and $15,000 for a full nose and mouth mask, and I assess the uh, unpaid wages for the providing the goods and services on a W-4. And so, <laughs> now, the, now that Walmart has employed me to wear a mask in there, so they employed me, so they gotta pay for it. If they order it, they gotta pay for it. Hmm. Using a W-4 though, huh? Well, they withheld my pay. I provided goods and services of wearing a mask to Walmart. We never agreed on a price and they never paid me, so I assessed my own value for the goods and services I, I provided them. And I did provide it because I have a receipt saying I was there, so. I could, I, I, mean, I could charge 30000 or something like that, and I, I just said 5000 and 15000 what I'm settled at, that's fine. I mean, you could do more. Well, I don't understand, why do you use a W-4 for? An because I, holding because, because when, they or, when they ordered goods and services from me, they didn't pay me. They withheld my pay for the goods and services, so a withholding certificate on line 4C has a dollar amount for how much they withheld from my pay. They never paid me, so they, that's why I assess the unpaid wages that they should pay me for the goods and services I provided under their employee policy. Policy only, only applies to employees, not to strangers, but they want to apply it to me. I'm a de facto employee, and so if they want goods and services from me, they gotta pay for it. And I assess the, I assess the withheld unpaid wages on line 4C of the, of the W-4, and I write exempt under line 4C like it says to in the, in the instructions. And then I include then I then I include the and then I include the receipt with the uh, with the W four and send it off uh, with a ten forty V and a ten forty off to uh, thirty four thirteen at Pennsylvania Avenue fifteen hundred Pennsylvania Avenue the remittance office room thirty four thirteen fifteen hundred Pennsylvania Avenue the remittance office up there in DC and let them handle it. They got goods and services for me, didn't pay me. I damn, you're gonna pay me. I'm gonna assess how much the value of my goods and services on a, on a W-4 because you withheld my pay. Have you ever actually received payment? Well, this pandemic was only last year. I'm still going through the tax court to go back 20 years and get all the 2603 transfer, transfer taxes from all these previous jobs, utility companies, anyone that used that social security number, employed the social security number. Now I have to go back and get the accounting and I provide my accounting. Uh, I, come, I come up with my own accounting and I ask these utility companies or anybody else, this is what I assess the value of the transfer of all the credits going through that account. If you have a different accounting, let me know. Otherwise we'll agree on this exorbitant amount and let them, let them default and default on their accounting and my accounting becomes the fact under, under Davila versus Shalala, Shalala, Davila versus Shalala, it's an administrative ruling that says he who fails to, pro, to produce, he, he who fails to produce or recreate the record must expect the court to rule contrary to their position. So I provide my accounting and if they want to come back with their accounting, I'll accept their accounting, but if they go silent, my accounting now becomes the fact in the case and that's how much I assess on a W-4, because I have all that credit, the principal amount of the credit that I loaned them, and they never paid me back the principal loan, so they withheld that principal loan amount, and that withholding goes on a W-4, line 4C, or line 6 on the old one. <clears throat> interesting approach, huh? I want to know more about it. Though. I think well, anyone else. Just, uh, I've done it. With, I've done it with utility companies in the past, and my my Social Security benefit has tripled since 2014. And the utility company wrote back two weeks afterwards in the middle of winter saying, we need to read your meter, it's in a locked area. I called them up and I said, okay, well, when was the last time you read the meter? They said, five years ago. I said, the law says you have to read it every two months. How'd you do it last time? They said, oh, we don't have that. And so they, they're just doing cost averaging. So with that utility company who hadn't read the meter in five years when they got with the, when the IRS got wind that the utility company was employing the name and social security number, using it for transactions, all of a sudden their books are getting audited and they want the meter reading to be as tiny as possible and as accurate as possible because now their books are getting audited because the IRS wants their 13% withholding tax on the W-4 and so they're getting audited. Uh. I mean, if you thought, when I fill out an application to go to work, I give them a W-4. When I fill out an application for the utility company, they get a W-4. Every application with any company, I assess how much credit goes to the account on the W-4 because there's an application for work, application for anything, is employing the name and social security number. 
because there's name and social security number on the application for credit, which is what I'm extending to these companies. I'm authorizing an Article 5 letter of credit to fund that account, and then they have to pay the taxes on the, and everything goes through that account because the social security account is the source of all the credit that they have a tax liability under 2603 of Title 26. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I understand in theory what you're doing, but it'd be, to actually carry it out, it would uh, be lost. Well, the, the fun thing about line 4C is how much, how much additional amount you want withheld from your paycheck on the old one. On the new one, it says extra amount you want withheld from your paycheck. So when I write $10,000, $30,000 on line 6, I'm telling, I'm telling the company on line 8 at the bottom of the, 10, uh, the W-4, I'm saying don't pay me $30,000. It's an anti-claim. I'm not making a claim for thirty. I'm saying don't pay me $30,000, which is a credit on their books. If I were to tell you, don't pay me $10,000, it doesn't harm you. If I say, you owe me $10,000, well, we have a controversy, I made a claim. But if I say, don't pay me $10,000, well, the company, when I say, don't pay me this $30,000 on line 4C, that's a credit on their books. I'm authorizing withholding a $30,000 from that Social Security account, and now they have a withholding credit. And it becomes a withholding credit on the bottom of the 1040. And on the W-2s, I cast on my W-2s into excise tax using a 4852 because there is an income is a bunk word. I'm, and so I, I reassess it as an excise tax because I'm not a tax debtor. So how can I have income with a debt and find the source of the credit? So the, it's all an excise tax for me to recoup. That's a separate issue, but yeah, I'm the credit. I'm the credit on the... If you put a credit on their books, do they are they liable for the tax on that? Yes, they pay the they pay the thirteen the thirteen percent FICA under Subtitle C. There's a third party in Subtitle C. Um, Subtitle A has no enforcement statutes, but Subtitle C does because of a third party involved in Subtitle C. The Social Security Administration wants their thirteen percent into the Social Security account, so there's enforcement statutes under Subtitle C, which the W four authorizes that withholding. So the IRS wants to collect that that thirteen percent. Now to recoup it as Subtitle A, it's my election to either pay the taxes or assess the taxes under Subtitle A. And so if I don't tell the IRS I gave $30,000 to the electric company or to the mortgage company, if I don't tell the IRS I transferred that credit, I pay the tax. But if I do tell the IRS that the 2603 taxable transfer E under Title 26, 2603A1 is the, tr if I tell the IRS who got the credit, now they pay the taxes and I get to recoup. So I, the, the W-4 is an assessment form that sets up for subtitle A recoupment. Okay. Cool. Hello, Karen. Do you folks? No, it, it, it's, no, it's, hey, this, this is good. We're here. The reason why I hear that, so I appreciate it. And it's, so the whole purpose of my, my doing all this is not to get my money back. My duty as an agent for that Social Security card, which if you read the back of it, it says it doesn't belong to me, it doesn't belong to you. And if you read the back of the big piece that everyone throws away, the big piece says keep this stub, important information on the back. When you turn over the big stub, it says if your name, if your U.S. citizenship, or your status as an alien changes, it says it's the back of the big piece of the Social Security uh, placard that comes in the mail says, I'm, says my status as an alien. The first two are conditional. If your name, if your U.S. citizenship, or your status as an alien is a claim on the back of that stub. Well, I don't own the card. I'm an alien to the card. Well, my duties to the card is as an agency where I have a duty to place orders. I order all the time, order all kinds of goods and services to place orders keep records, luckily they keep records, and report to my principal of the Internal Revenue Service how much credit was transferred from that Social Security account based on an application, an Article 5 letter of credit application of credit to that corporation who receives that credit. And now I have a duty as the agent to report the credit that was transferred to that corporation. Otherwise, I'm an agent de tort and I become liable for the taxes. If I, do, if I do my duty, they become liable and I get a recoupment. If I don't report the credit that goes through, uh, I become liable. If I do report it, well, they become taxable and I, be, and I get the recoupment because I reported that the Social Security account was the source of the credit. And if I'm the source, 
not going to tax tax me to give it back to me if I'm the source. They only tax the tax transfer e trustee and transfer or to skip persons under twenty six oh three. That's who's liable. But they're only liable if I tell the IRS about it by doing an assessment on the W four. I have this. All I have this. In, all that's explained in twenty six oh three. If I go read twenty six oh three. 2603 implicates who's liable. It says personal liability for tax. That's what 2603 says. So it's implied in there. If they're liable for the tax, then I have to tell the IRS how much credit was transferred to them. There's also sections, it'll be on the recording. There's 2203, 2002, and uh, 2203 says a fiduciary has, uh, a fiduciary is anyone with actual or constructive possession of deceased estate property. 2002 says an executor is liable for the tax. And then you have 2032, which is an alternate valuation of the estate. And then 2032A says any fiduciary must be bonded under 2032A, parentheses E, parentheses 11, has to have a bond in place from the Secretary of Treasury in Puerto Rico because there's already a lien against the estate under 6324 of Title 26. There's already a lien against the estate. And so Anyone using any part of the estate has to be bonded under 2032A for an alternate valuation of the estate. That's when I send in my assessment of the value that was transacted in the account under 2032A, alternate, I mean 2032, alternate valuation of the estate of a fiduciary who has actual or constructive possession of that estate value and, and must be bonded under 2032A E11 for the alternate valuation of the estate under 2032 of a fiduciary in 2203 as a, who has an Executive and, and as, a, as an executor has a li has the liability to pay the tax under 2002 in the amount of a tax rate on 2001. Those are the only five sections of Title 26 we have to worry about. But if I don't act like the creditor assessing the taxes, because only the king assesses taxes, so I assess the tax. If I don't do it, I'm liable. If I do the assessment, they're liable. So it's my choice, my election, to either become the tax debtor or the tax creditor by reporting how much credit transfers these accounts using the W-4 assessment form. So there is referring to like a utility company or a bank anyone, lending. Anyone who receives an application for credit on the social security name and number that creates an account number. That name and account number is a person. It's an estate administered by that corporation. And so they have a tax liability only if I tell the IRS about it. Uh, and because it's, and most of us have, you know, filled out that application for like the power company years ago. Well, you can go back and assess all, well, you can get all the statements, or you can do your own estimation of what it is, take the highest years and go back all those years. This is my estimate of how much credit, and it's both sides of the ledger. The statements and the payments, you have to add both those together because the statement's a positive amount. It's not a debt. It's a positive amount. If it was a debt, it would be a negative amount. But both sides of the ledger, even on your bank account, all the deposits, all the withdrawals, all the statements, all the payments, all the charges, all the payments. The double ledger accounting is how much credit transfers to that account. That goes on line, four, uh, line 4C or line 6 of the W-4. And now they have to pay the taxes on that. And you get the recoupment. You get the eighty-seven percent. They get the thirteen. The IRS. No, 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 no. Under subtitle, the 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 thirteen percent transfer tax. That's what the corporation has to pay. The, the double-sided ledger. Add those together is the amount of the recoupment as a tax credit. And then there's so, we have to check. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, if there's a ten thousand dollar debit and a ten thousand dollar credit. You are recouping twenty thousand, not zero. At, as a tax credit, because both sides of the ledger are tied to the social security number and become social security credit. When you deposit, when you deposit, when you deposit a check at the bank into my, my into my social security numbered account, well, what source is that check? You know, well, it's all tied to the social. Even everything's tied to the social. So what if you had a bank account with no social security number on it? Would this not be, uh, apply? But what do you use? A, a, a registered mail number? The nine digits in the registered mail number? What number do you use? I didn't have to use one. I just, it's a long story, but I, don't, I have a checking account with no social security number on it. But then that, that would seem to fall under Title 26, 1341, a claim of right for your labor, and you could tie it to the social. I'm not, I'm not afraid of the social. I love the social. Um, oh, yeah. There's a, 1341 under, is frauds and swindles, though, isn't it? No, Title 26. Well, Title 26. 
Yeah, I was and they, re they only refer to the 1939 federal regulations, which you can't get, which I'll be subpoenaing from the tax court in my follow-on uh, supplemental petition, that there's a claim of right where your labor is a, is a write-off because my labor can't be taxed. So, And they've hidden that 1939 federal regulation, but I'll be getting that. I'll be passing it on to Carrie. The claim of right, I'll send that to Carrie as well. Great. I love it. I've actually wow. used her for a in Arizona. Now, again, this is Title 26, not Title 18. Well, I understand. I understand. But I don't understand the rest of it. <laughs> what, too much, what, too, short, too short a time. I mean, just, well, uh, yeah. you have to have, you, you, you'd be, we'd be insane to try and go and do what you just described without having a whole lot more knowledge about the, the finer details of how it's all done. <laughs> Well, I, I, gave you, I, I gave you all the details. It's the lack of conviction that I'm not the tax debtor. I'm the agent that assesses taxes. If I don't tell them, if I if, if your employer gives you money, they they try to pass the excise tax back to you. I mean, if, if I don't if, if if I hire independent contractors and I pay them ten thousand dollars, but don't give them a ten ninety nine miscellaneous or ten ninety nine NEC non employee compensation, well then I pay the taxes. If I do, if I do tell the IRS, say I gave these contractors ten grand out of ten ninety nine non employee compensation NEC form, which is a new form by the way, compared to the miscellaneous. If I if I tell the IRS who I transfer that ten thousand dollars to, well, they have the tax liability. If I don't tell the IRS, I pay the taxes and they get all ten grand with no taxes taken out. I'm the assessor. Hmm. Well, I see what you're saying. I just I'm not comfortable with the knowledge just yet, since it's the first time I've heard it. Well, sure. Oh, you you got to mortgage. Yeah, you got to understand something. We've been trained. We've been taught one way. He's trying to show you that there's more than one way. So, either, and, and so now he, you know, he's showing that, and he was recorded. So, if I was you, I would go ahead and listen to it several times. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. For, the, for the mortgage, you had a temp, you had a promissory note which you gave away. And it was transferred to the mortgage company. That's one transfer tax. And the mortgage company holds onto that promissory note with a pay to blank. And then they, they open up a conduit loan with a servicing company. Your mortgage loan and your servicing loan usually are different. Almost always are different. And they use that promissory note as collateral for a conduit loan to a servicing company that sets up right. a retail installment that sets up a retail installment agreement, does an amortization, yeah. and then I come in as an undisclosed third party investor and an undisclosed irrevocable beneficiary to that retail installment agreement. And so there's two sides of the ledger up at the servicing company. How much the it's amortization like your mortgage, right? Amort yes. At there's a in the servicing company there's an amortization schedule and a payment schedule on the payoff quote. Shows both sides of the ledger. Okay. Both of those okay. get added together for the servicing company W four withholding. And then the the promissory note itself, that's also a transfer tax to the uh, to the mortgage company. So you have have uh, at least two different two different uh, W-4s for that, that process because the reason I do this is we all wish to be involuntary compliance with the Internal Revenue Code, don't, don't we? And I want to make sure everyone pays their fair share of taxes. And I've said this to the IRS. I, I, it's my intention to be involuntary compliance and I need your help to collect this information so we can make sure the transferees pay their taxes. I'm not here to try. It's, it's not a gimme, gimme, gimme. I want to make sure these corporations pay the taxes to lower the national debt. That's my whole purpose. It's a, as much as there's a benefit in it for me, I want to make sure we can lower the national debt because we're going down to shit hole right now with all these trillions. And until we assess the taxes, it's just going to go down the hole. So that's my noble reason for doing it. I want to make sure they pay the taxes. I also like the fact that they're going to be crying in their boardrooms. I like that idea too. But uh, <laughs> that's a separate so what can you expect to recoup out of a, of a, of a, a 30 year mortgage you've been paying for 20 years? What? Well, you, you, get, you get the payoff code as Payoff quote says the amortization schedule and the payment schedule. Add both of those together. And when you write up the W-4 for that, let's say it's a $100,000 house, it'll be $300,000 on the mortgage side, and you paid probably $150,000, uh, $50,000 on the payment side. When you put those together, when you say, I authorize you to not pay me $450,000, that becomes a credit on their books. If you, if you if you had a job, if you had a job and you brought home five thousand dollars on your paycheck every month, exactly five grand, and you go to the W four and you say how the extra amount I want withheld from my paycheck, and I write five thousand dollars, well, my paycheck every month would be zero. 
But at the end of the year, I would have $60,000 in withholding. And I would file on the excise tax withholding section on the 1040, $60,000. And that's how I would re recoup my $60,000 that was extra amount withheld. Because that extra amount withheld is credit on the employer's side, and they report that credit on their side. Same thing with, the, uh, with this uh, servicing company. $300,000 amortization, $150,000 paid in, $450,000 total on line 4C, on, a w, on that W4-4C. I authorize you to not pay me $450,000. That becomes a credit on their books. Same thing, and, and, and then you have $450,000 in excise tax withholding. Everything's an excise tax. 100% of the price of everything you purchase is an excise tax. And that's how we recoup our excise tax. Do you receive any money if so from who? You file a 1040 with a W with that with that excise tax amount in the bottom section of the 1040. You get your credit and back. Held? As the amount withheld would be the like sixty thousand or whatever. Yes, whatever's on line four C is a withholding. If you write five if you write five thousand dollars on four C of your W four for twelve months, that's sixty thousand dollars withholding. Like in my example of making five grand a month and I authorize my employer to, to withhold five thousand dollars from my paycheck, my paycheck would be zero every month. And then in the year I would have sixty thousand dollars in withholding credit that I get to recoup on the excise withholding section at the bottom of the ten forty. So would the IRS be paying you that? Of course. Have you, have you ever done a tax return before? Uh, yeah. Well, you fill out the you fill out the bottom of the ten forty, which says how much withheld, right? And if they over withhold, you get it back, right? Right. Okay. So that's the same. Back. It's the same thing. Okay. But I did change. I, had, I did. Cha I did change my accounting accounting uh, from cash to accrual. I did change from cash to accrual, so there's a rollover for the tax credit accounting accrual. That's just that, the concept now is just assessing the taxes. And you can go back and change your accrual method anytime. Because um, no one told you about the cash versus accrual method. If it's cash, it's only for that year. Accrual can roll over. So the tax credits will roll over and tax credits are money. But right now, just getting the idea that how we assess the taxes is what I'm talking about. The change in the accrual method is a separate issue. Um, so all I'm saying is don't pay me $30,000. There was a guy in uh, Appalachia, African-American man, and his house was a okay house, and he wrote to Duke Energy, and he did the W-4. Back then it said, on line six, $30,000 withheld, exempt. He said, uh, I called him after I did mine. He said, uh, Robert, what happened? He said, oh, two white guys from Duke Energy showed up. I went, oh, no. He said, no, no, no. They came out here, and they put... They put insulation in my roof, insulation under the house, put new seals around the doors and windows, wrapped the pipes, and gave me energy-efficient light bulbs. And I said, Robert, I told him what happened to me with, with ComEd. They said uh, ComEd had to read the meter all of a sudden for the first time in five years. I said, Robert, as soon as the IRS learns that these electric companies are employing the name and social security number, everything going through that account is taxable at the 13% for FICA under the employment tax. And, and Duke Energy came out to your house to make sure your house is as efficient as possible so they pay as little tax as possible. And for ComEd, they wanted to read the meter in the middle of winter with snow just two stories tall, but they had to read that meter because now they're getting audited and they want the most accurate meter reading so they pay as little tax as possible or the exact amount of tax as possible that turned out because they had been cheating the IRS. They owed more than they were showing on the meter after five years of income averaging. They were way off. So as soon as the IRS hears about it, oh, 13% from these guys, they're going to go out and audit the books. Wow. I'm going to be listening to this one a bunch of times. And there's been no repercussions? No. No. Uh, no, no kind of legal action coming in and trying to scare you, intimidate you? I mean, no, I'm not, I'm not making a claim. I'm making the mandate claim. Don't pay me $30,000. Okay. Or whatever. So whatever. if it didn't work... Go ahead, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. 
you need a con well, work. It's not. It's not about work. It's about employing the name and social security number. It has nothing to do with my labor. My labor is a contribution that I get to recoup. That's a separate issue from labor and working in Title Fifteen, Section Seven. Not, I'm not, I mean, Title Seven, Section Fifteen. I'm not. We're just talking about the corporations employing the name and social security number by receiving an application, Article Five, letter of credit to establish a credit account that funds that credit account because I was interested in electricity. I get it. I get my electricity the upfront, but the principal amount of the loan, the amount of all the statements I have to file to recoup, because I'm loaning them credit. I'm loaning them credit to fund the, fund the electrical account. So the principal amount is the statements plus the payments. The interest payment is the electricity I was interested in. So they pay me my interest up front because you always get principal and interest. Interest is paid first, principal is returned last. So I get my interest up front in electricity because I was interested in electricity, which is why I gave them the letter of credit that funded the electrical account. So I get my interest up front, but then I have to file all the statements plus the payments to tell the IRS this is how much credit was transferred to the electric company so I can recoup that principal amount of credit back. Because they, cause they withheld my principal amount. They didn't pay me back my principal amount, the statements plus the payments, that which is also a loan to them. And so I have to tell the IRS, this is the principal amount that was loaned to the electric company, the statements plus the payments, and I take my statements and I write pay to the United States Treasury and sign it and over to the, to the IRS. I, and at the end of the year, they have a full accounting of everything that happened in that account. And the IRS goes, oh, we get 13% of this. That's cool, because I assessed how much principal amount of credit was transferred to the electric company. But I got my interest payment up front. And that principal amount is returned. There can be, it's, it's called return of interest to principal is what it's called. So the returning, the principal amount I loan back to me as an excise tax, if I'm paying their excise tax, everything's an excise tax, and I'm loaning them credit to pay their excise tax. They like to pass the excise tax off to us as if I'm the debtor, but I'm the source of the credit. So I, I assess the tax, and I get the excise tax back instead of the corporation running away with it, pushing the credit, pushing the debt off to me. When so the, the name that you fill out on the top of the W-4 would be the name of the, like, utility company or... No, 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 no. I don't know the last time you looked at the W-4. The name of the top is like on a check. If you look at a bank check, on the upper left-hand corner has my name on it. The top of the W-4 has my name and social security number on it. Then the, right. on, the old w, on the old W-4 at the bottom, it says the employer. That's the pay to line. The dollar amount of the pay to is on line 4C or line 6. So that's the pay to amount. Then I sign it like, then I sign it like I do a check. So all the elements of a bank draft are in the W-4 form. The old one's better. It looks like a check. So when I say, Can you don't still use that one? What? Could you still use that older one or? See, like, I'm, I'm looking at a W-4 for 2020. Yeah, no, look, look, at, look at line 4C. Uh -huh. you, see a uh -huh. you see a dollar sign? On line 4C, there's a yeah. dollar sign. Yes. So yeah, have, there is so a dollar sign in there. So I have my name at the top. I have who gets right. it at the bottom. I have a dollar amount on 4C. I have a signature line. It's a draft. It's a draft against the Social Security account authorizing a transfer of credit, line 4C, how much I don't want to get paid, or extra amount withheld was what it says on the new one, and that's how much I want to transfer to that corporation. Now they have tax credit, because I authorize a disbursement based on that application for credit, which established that account, and then the employer section, I put the electric company account number, I get their EIN number, and I get the date it was open, and I, and I uh, send it off to the IRS with my statements as evidence of debt, because 2203 says a fiduciary is anyone with actual or constructive possession of deceit in the state property. And Title 18, Section Section 8, obligation of the United States is any representative of value at the bottom of the Title 18, Section 8. And there's also Title 31, 31, 21, I think it is, obligation of the United States. So, 31, 24. Well, the 24 says uh, it's about credit, isn't it? Uh, anyway, I'm not going to argue that right now. So those statements are representatives of value, and that's an obligation of the United States. So I write pay to, pay to United States Treasury, like it says on the 1040V in box three, make your money order, pay to United States Treasury. And I take that obligation, and I say pay to United States Treasury, and then I assess the taxes. And now the IRS, now the IRS on behalf of the United States Treasury can assess, assess the credit to pay down the national debt. And it becomes a recoupment for me. 
because I authorized the disbursement by filling out that letter of credit, UCC Article 5 letter of credit, application for credit. Every application's for credit, every declaration's for war. So, so every application's an application for credit, and that's what funds the operation, because all these corporations are bankrupt, the whole country's bankrupt, and the only way the government can make money is impost duty and excise tax. Impost and duty happens at the docks, excise tax is pushed off to the consumer. So I'm paying the corporation's excise tax so I can acquire legal title of goods. I purchased a tax lien sale uh, several years ago for $1,000. That's the outstanding tax. So when I transferred $1,000 to the Secretary of State, I got a property patent. Because I paid the tax, I got legal title to the property. When I go to 7-Eleven to buy some juicy fruit or zebra gum, it's a dollar. But I pay, pay that dollar plus the nine cents. Well, that dollar and nine cents, the total price is an excise tax. By paying that dollar and nine cents, I get a receipt. That receipt is titled to the goods, and it's also a, it's also a security. Those receipts we get back from the from these stores can also be redeemed because it's evidence of value. So because it's representative of value, I can take all my receipts, send it off to the treasury with a form 1522 to recoup the value of all my receipts. The receipts are redeemable because I'm the creditor. I'm never a debtor. So anything that represents value, I get to assess and recoup. It's the idea that I'm the creditor. That's the first legal, the first big jump. And then that both sides of the ledger on every account are tied to the Social Security credit, and the transferee has the tax liability. When I when I deposit ten thousand dollars in my bank, I have a ten thousand dollar deposit on one side. Then I write a check for a thousand dollars against it. Well, most people think they take a thousand dollars off the deposit side. Well, they don't, because if you look on your statement, you have deposits and withdraw. So every time I write a check, every time I write a check, it puts something on the withdrawal side. And, it, and it's tied to the social. So the difference between the stack is 9000 I write another $1,000 check. We took her. And it, it, every time I sign my name, it's a new issue of credit from the Treasury. I'm authorizing a new issue of credit from the Treasury because only I can authorize issues of credit because the government's bankrupt. So when I write another check, the difference in the stack is 8000 So it's the difference in stacks that both sides of the stacks are tied to the social because the banks take these deposits and the checks and they, they go out and they, they, they monetize all these checks we write and the CAFR funds and everything. So both sides of the ledger are my credit. And I add them both sides together and now I assess how much credit was transferred to them that they never would pay me back. The credit that they never paid me back was withheld from me. So the withholding certificate is the certificate I use. A certificate is a security, by the way. Birth certificates are securities, otherwise it would be a, be a birth notice. County so the, the withholding certificate is an assessment of how much credit was transferred to these line eight persons with a name and account number at the bottom of the of the W four. And ask the woman. Hey, right. it's, 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 come, it's getting over the idea that I'm never a debtor. I am the source of the credit, and now I can assess how much credit was transferred because I was interested in acquiring something, and by paying their excise taxes, how I get legal title to, the, to that thing I was interested in, and then I can take that receipt and redeem the receipt to recoup all my credit. Can I ask a question for clarification? Sure. On that yeah, so uh, earlier you said uh, if you're working for a company, you can take the, uh, the amount of payment, say that you use the example $5,000 a month, and put that on line 4C of the W-4 and not, get in, not receive any pay during the year. And then on the, at the end of the year, when you fill out your tax form, you claim that as withholding. But that's, that's an example I use to show that the line 4C turns into a tax credit withholding credit that we get to recoup. When I do, when I go work for a company, I typically use a form W-4-V and I say on line seven, stop withholding any state or federal income tax. But if you use a normal W-4, when they send you the W-2, which is an employee withholding, that's under the 1939 Federal Tax Act that says employees have to work for the government in a trader business, look up trader business under 7701 of Title 26, someone who holds public office. Well, the, uh, the W-2 is the company's attempt to push the excise tax onto you as income. I take the W-2 and use 4850 to form 4852 and recast the W-2 income as excise tax that goes at the bottom of the form. I have a question. I'm sure he'll... 4852, the form 4852, I recast. Pete Henderson uses that. He uses the same form but in a different system. I don't know what system it is, but the 4852 recast 
podcast says an excise tax. I don't, Pete Hendrickson probably doesn't use the W-4 to recoup all the credit. That's true. But uh, he's, brilliant what he, he's brilliant in what he's done so far. I, I really, I, I read his work. That's where I got the 4852 from in the first place. Um, yeah. that, we, we don't have, I can't have taxable income when I'm the source of the credit. It's retarded. I'm going to tax me to get it back to me. And it's, I'm only taxable if I don't tell the IRS who I, who I transfer the credit to. Then I become an agent who's on tort and I'm liable for the tax. The excise yeah, tax. Is equitable right of redemption. Question. So going back to the $5,000, uh, putting the $60,000 per year on the W, uh, W4 line 4C, I think you said. Uh, I paid $5,000 a month, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, and then taking that sixty thousand dollars at the end of the year and putting it on your ten forty and claiming that it was withholding and then requesting the money back is that? Did I understand that correctly? That's the example I use to show everything you're paying to the electric company is a withholding that you have to recoup. What about so, so going back to the Walmart situation with a mask, where you uh, where you say you, you charge them ten thousand dollars for wearing the mask and five thousand dollars for something else, I can't remember what it was, but it's, it's, it's five it's five and fifteen. That you, I could charge more. It's five and fifteen. <laughs> yeah, so five five and fifteen. So you put twenty thousand dollars on the line four C, uh, send it to the IRS, and then at the end of the year, can you put that twenty thousand dollars on um, on your uh, uh, your 1040 and when I when I, t- when I take when I take the W4 I, I take every receipt and on the receipt I put a little check mark I put a little check on it to carry you know a little check on it to say that it's been checked and then uh, and then that is for the goods and services supplied on the top of the W4 uh, now I include a statement with it, the old one but anyway this, and I, I send an invoice and put a full amount and that invoice is paid to the United States Treasury, and then I put attach all the receipts, and on line 4C is the, how I put the goods and services supplied to Walmart by wearing apparel according to their employee policy. That's where I do my assessment in line 4C for every time I went to Walmart last year. They ordered me to pay, they ordered me to do it, and I accepted their order, and now they gotta pay for it. So I, because we didn't agree on the value of my goods and services, I do my own assessment of the value of those goods and services that I supply to them under their employee manual as a de facto employee, but they never paid me for my goods and services, so it's a withholding. It withheld my pay. And, that's, and I include the receipts to show I was there. I'm not going to make up crazy shit like that. I'm not going to lie to the IRS, because I, 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 I want to, I have no reason to lie to the IRS. I'm the creditor. Um, and, and then I and then you take the W four with the receipt with the invoice with the ten forty V and 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 a ten forty the bottom of the ten forty I'm filling out the bottom of the ten forty for every, you can send in multiple ten forties all year long to do the assessment and send that off to room thirty four thirteen at fifteen hundred Pennsylvania Avenue at the uh, remittance office and bills of exchange office and on the receipts I write paid to United States Treasury each receipt paid to that little stamp paid to United States Treasury and sign it. Markdown is and now that we see. Okay, exactly. I was going to say that 1040 you, uh, with a credit on the bottom would go to the U.S. Treasury. Okay. The withholding on the bottom. Next question, but yeah, right. Um, okay. So in the, um, the withhold, it's withholding for them. It's credit for me, but to the withholding section because they withheld my credit. And now, now the corporations have to pay their fair share of taxes because they're bankrupt, and now they have to pay. The second petition. That's cool. That's hilarious. If I, and if I don't, if I don't tell them, you know, all these corporations have huge buildings. I mean, with Google and all this shit. I'm also assessing a tax against Google, and Twitter suspended my account, so I got their 10K, got their EI number and I'm doing a pro rata share of all the profits they made based on my account and how many accounts they had how much profit they made and I'm going to go to because they terminated my account that's a taxable termination so I'm doing a W4 against Twitter to assess the amount of value I contributed to them by having an account with them and now and now they get to pay uh, I'm, I'm recouping my termination amount let them argue go ahead and argue with the IRS I'm just the assessor and you can't bitch at me I'm, to argue with the IRS. Here's the proof what was of, the, of my taxable termination. Now I get to determine, do an assessment of the value of that account based on their 10K, which has their EIN number, by the way. That's how you find EIN numbers. Yeah, now just, I'm gonna just think, if we, just think if we had a million or 10 million people doing the same thing you're doing, they but there's even a, there's, there's, even a, there's even a better thing. All these false statements that by the FDA, CDC, 
NIH, Mr. Fuki, all these people making false statements under, t under Consumer Protection 15, 1692E, false statements have a penalty under 78FF of Title 15 of $25 million. I am in the process of putting together evidence of false statements, and I'm going to assess each one of those assholes who are making false statements, which are damaging the consumers under Consumer Protection, and hitting them with $25 million withholding because they made a false statement, because now there's a, there's a, there's a penalty that applies to them that they've never paid me, so that's a withholding. And I'm going to assess the withholding of $25 million. Now they're going to be paying 13% taxes. <laughs> and to wipe them out. And, and if, every, if we got 100 million people to do it, it would wipe these pharmaceutical companies off the map. Oh, that would be fun. I'm up in mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of... Thank you, guys. Thank you. What, because I'm telling the IRS that someone owes the money? What are they going to do? Why would the IRS get mad at me for them giving them the ammunition? The IRS is in this for profit. They're a for-profit foreign corporation, giving the, and they own all these Social Security numbers and EIN numbers from the IMF. Uh, IMF issues them, and so the IRS issues them and Social Security Administration. So my telling them credit that was due to the to this foreign corporation. The IMF was created by the Exchange Stabilization Fund in 1934. The Exchange Stabilization Fund is a corporate soul at the basement of the Federal Reserve Building in New York, which is the United States. So all these numbers are foreign, and they're here for profit. And even the president is not is not immune from taxes. Neither is Pelosi. No one's immune from taxes, and no one's immune from the postal court regulations because those are global governance. And so, and because the Exchange Stabilization Fund created the IMF and the World Bank as straw men for their corporate soul, which is the Exchange Stabilization Fund. They hold all the gold in the basement of the Federal Reserve Building in New York. So um, the IRS, what, what the IRS going to get mad at me? They don't. IRS doesn't care about these corporations. They're happy to go scoop up any amount of money from these corporations as long as we tell them we transfer the tax to them. And because we, because we're kings of the nation, I know Larry doesn't, uh, doesn't like that, but I'm because we're kings of the nation, we assess the taxes and have our agencies go out and recoup our taxes for us. Coming in as the commissioner. Okay. So if the average guy. You're using your own sixty to five thousand a month, sixty thousand a year, and puts that online twenty five C for it's under federal Okay, again, don't worry about your income because you don't have a tax on the income. Carrie has shown that we don't have a twenty we don't have an assessment right. determination. No, I'm just uh, companies won't give me I'm just dealing with the W four line four C sixty thousand dollar figure of don't pay me sixty thousand, I'm reporting it to the IRS, okay? So, we're not talking about a let me, ask you that, kit. let me ask you that question, then you can explain how if I'm wrong or whatever. Not the tax so yeah, I get this sixty thousand, I've no, done it on a W four, notify the proper parties, set it up to no, the uh, no, no, there's around. only one party. There's only one party. You, your job is to order, keep records and report to the IRS, not to the corporation. You send this to the IRS. And now I get to Okay, that's where the W four goes. All right. So then I've done all that and now at the end of the year I'm gonna file my 1040 form, and it's gonna have no income for wages or salary or any of that sort of nonsense. It's just gonna have a figure under the federal income tax withheld on the back of the form, on page two of the 1040 form, that says sixty thousand dollars taxes due zero refund amount sixty thousand dollars. Would you actually get that refund, or would you just get a bucket of grief and they try to come and hassle you or whatever? So, but I have to go back and basically say I have the conviction. It'll. Number one, your example is flawed. If you're actually working for the man, you will get a normal W-2. If you want to you get paid nothing, you can add that amount, but you won't have any have any toilet paper money for the year. That, that example, because most people know about employment, that, that example is to show how much credit was how much credit was transferred to that electric company that they didn't pay you. I use that five thousand dollars online for you. See, just as an example of how most people know that if you overpay your taxes, you get a recoupment at the end of the year. That happens. You know that happens. So that, that's not even a, so that's that's a conviction you can stand on when you do the same thing for every other social security base, name a numbered account administered by a fiduciary corporation who has liability for the taxes. So and I read the And again, I'm just telling the IRS, here's my accounting and, and 
and they're yeah, like, yeah, good, I'm done a good faith. I always write done a good faith when I do these things, and, and I ask them if you have a better way to do it, if you see any corrections I need to make, please, please let me know. I'm here to help. My intention is to be involuntary compliance with the Internal Revenue Code, and in furtherance of my intention to be involuntary compliance with the Internal Revenue Code, here's my assessment. Please let me know if you need any help, so I can do do a better job for you, so that we can make sure everyone pays their fair share of taxes. After all, we all wish to be involuntary compliance with the Internal Revenue Code, don't we? Thank you for your assistance. I look forward to hearing from you. I write letters. I did this back in 2010, and the IRS has been no grief at all. And I don't report these W-4s to the corporation because my duty is to report to the IRS. Right, so I report all these forms to the IRS. I might do labor for these corporations, but I don't have a duty to report anything to that corporation. The corporation has a duty to report to the IRS just like I do. And it removes, us, it, it, it removes me from having a controversy and going to war with these corporations, which is why they set up this administrative system the way it is. We have a third-party overarching global entity that now comes in as an enforcement agency to make sure everyone behave so that we don't go to war and start shooting at other, shooting each other again like we did under Lincoln's bullshit. But, uh, and so that's why it's set up this way with this administrative overlay so we don't go to war. Unpaid wages. Okay, so could the average man or woman that actually was out there working at Walmart or whatever, could they take their, their, their monthly, let's say they get paid just once a month, they take their monthly check and put the withholding amount on there the, on the blind 4C of the W-4 and send them it off to the IRS so that here's my accounting because uh, that then comes back to them right that with the amount that was taken out of their pay was, is like prepaid but you should get it back at the end of the year when you that paycheck went to the bank, you're going to do the assessment on the bank with a W-4, all the deposits, all the withdrawals. If you're working for an employer, do not fuck with the employer. You will get fired. Why do you use a W-4? Yeah, yeah, oh, I understand. That's, uh, that's why I'm asking these silly, they might seem like silly questions, but if you're trying to employ this, you got to kind of, I just want to know more about it. That's the bottom line. I think you're, you're, you're hitched on this. Uh, if you if you want to get a zero paycheck and authorize it withholding, go ahead and do that, and you can recoup it at the end of the year. Paid wages. Right now, when I get paid, there's an automatic deposit, I never get paid, it goes directly to the bank, so my employer becomes a transfer or transferring my my delayed the value of my contributions as to a skip person. The bank is the skip person, the employer skipped me, sent the deposit to the bank, so the, the employer is the transfer or transferring to a skip person, because they didn't pay me, they went to the bank as a skip person, so the employer is liable, to the, liable for that amount of taxes, which is the entire amount, under 2603. And then, then, then I do the assessment on the bank. All the deposits, all the withdrawals get to W-4. But I do not screw with my employer by playing silly games because it's going to freak them out. And you're going to become a squeaky wheel, and then you'll be fucked. But, um, so, I understand. I understand. Uh, that's great. But, but you could do it, though, too, the, to you, with the bank each, um, I don't know, periodically? Would you do it once a year, once a month, once a quarter? How, how would you do it? You could do quarterly filings if you want to, but at the end, there's only one 1040 for the year. I mean, there's only yeah. one final 1040 for the year, so yeah, yeah. you could do you could do a quarterly. You could do quarterly just to make your paperwork less onerous at the end of the year. That's fine. But I, I just have to make sure the IRS knows who's receiving Social Security sourced credit from applications for credit that was transferred to these corporations, creating a brand new person, name and number to count the person, just like the Social Security cards of person. And I have it's my duty to assess the taxes to tell them how much credit was transferred and how much credit was withheld. If you have a different of course, I got the interest up front and tangible goods and the interest up front. And that, that's my duty to report to the IRS. Keep re order, keep records, and report to the IRS. becomes the fact. And so that's what I do. Under Davila versus Because I want to make, because after all, we all wish to be involuntary compliance with the Internal Revenue Code, don't we? I use that all the time in my letter. He, feel, he who fails yeah. to produce or I get it. So if we're unclear about any part of this, is, how do we, how do we um, find out the details uh, of this, the minutia that you're talking about how well, come back, like get in contact with you or something. No, next week uh, over the week start chewing it over because most people don't realize they think they're a debtor and they think they you know it's silly um, so after chewing about it you have if it withholding goes on a W4 it comes down to having the conviction of the heart of knowing that I'm the source of the credit my signature authorizes the the creation of new money on that credit application every time I sign my name I'm authorizing new credit to be issued and that's, that's because in 1933 the United States went bankrupt and we gave them three duties write treaties keep a navy and issue and issue coin and credit
currency. Well, when we went bankrupt, they took away the currency printing from the United States because they never paid their debts every 70 years. So if, if, we're the pe if we the people authorize that authority to issue coin and currency and they no longer do it, well, then it reverts back to our authority to issue coin and currency, and that's what I do when I sign my signature. I'm authorizing a new disbursement of credit from the Treasury, and it becomes an obligation of the United States. So that's knowing that piece right there, my signature authorizes the issue of credit on the UCC Article 5 letter of credit. Because the IRS wants their 13% withholding tax on the W-4. I'm a little, a little big on the accounting, the double ledger thing. I need to study up on that a little more. Terry, okay, but you, you, turned in, you, 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 turn, you turned in, you turned in a credit application. The credit application is an Article 5 letter of credit. That created the account. It's just called with the electric account. Everyone has electricity. And every month they send you a statement in the mail. That statement is a positive amount. That positive amount is not a debt. That's an actual negotiable instrument. Most of us just go ahead and pay both sides of the ledger. So I get a hundred dollar electric bill. I pay a hundred dollars out of my Social Security based checking account. So now the now the books are balanced. You have a thousand hundred dollars of usage on one side and a hundred dollar contribution on the other side. At the end of the year, both sides are tied to the both sides are tied to a Social Security linked account. You add both sides of the ledger because they're both Social Security tied linked account. So it's five thousand dollars in electricity in statements and five thousand dollars electricity in payment that's ten thousand dollars of social security based account that was that, that the electric company has in their coffers so that ten thousand dollars is the amount of credit that was transferred to the electric company that goes online 4c to assess how much how much credit i did not get paid back was withheld or additional amount i want withheld from my paycheck it's, the, the w4 can either be a draft against the account or an assessment of how much principal how much credit was transferred if I were to it's a, tell it's you, a, the don't w4 has like three or four different functions harm you. It's a, and so that ten thousand dollars is how much credit was transferred to the electric account because their statement admits it my checks prove it and when you get the final statement at the end of the year from the electric company it says amount of usage and amount of payment they admit to having that much credit and you add those together put it on online 4c the w4 take the coup take these statements and the statements are representative of Value, right, the statement represents value. There's a hundred dollars on it. Right, pay to the United States Treasury. Done in good faith. Income. Sign your name. A bunk word. And so I so pay to the United States Treasury. Treasury. Given for a patent right. Look up. Given for a patent right. It's in the Bill of Exchange Act. Given for a patent right. Done in good faith. Buy. Sign your name. Name and Social Security number. Put them all together. Put a staple in them because that makes it a form. A form has a wire in it. Attach it to the 1040V. And and then and then the 1040. But how much withholding is on there on the 1040? So the IR because now so I don't sign the 1040. I just make it a statement. And they have all the statements. And some of the IRS is getting their statements, like we just talked about. Now the IRS knows who to, who to go after to pay that 13 percent, and and who to who to credit the uh, recoupment for. Enforcement statutes under subtitle. On the W four. I understand that your point is to have to get them to pay their fair share into the national debt. What is my benefit on something like that? You have a withholding credit. Or you have a withholding credit. Subtitle A. Sure. So that the IRS. Of, of, you're, you're the what? Given that. Scenario, scenario you just said, ten thousand. I transfer at the end of the year. What's my withholding credit? Is it thirteen percent of that? Twenty thousand. No, tax. Thirteen percent is what the what the employer plays. Twenty-six. The ten thousand dollar credit. That ten thousand dollars is the amount of withholding credit that has credit. Now they pay the tax. Goes on your ten forty. And what happens with that credit? Does it get paid back to me, or does it sit there in an account? That's up. It depends whether or not you file a ten forty or not. Okay. Okay. Cool. I don't care. And, what, what was the lady going to say? And on the W-4, like on the step 5 sign, is that where you sign? And then the employer is, you know, uh, Con Ed or whoever. And then what do you put for the first date of employment and the employer identification number? Yeah, for that Social Security card. Okay. If you read the, back the, the, the day I opened, the, opened that account is the date the, the contract was created. One throws away. And he says, keep this stub important information. What, it doesn't matter. Whenever it was. When you turn over the big And uh, so the IRS knows how, how far back to go and start doing an assessment. And then, then as far as the EIN number, you can write them a letter. I said, letting them know I need your, your, your W-9 or 
W-8, and there's a $50 fine if you don't cough it up to me. Or you can go online to these corporations, type in the corporation's name into the Security Exchange Commission, and put in the ComEd 10-K. And when you pull up the 10-K from the Security Exchange Commission, it has ComEd EIN number right there. You can find the EIN number. They have to provide it to you if they ask for it. It's a $50 fine or a $500 fine if they don't give it to you. And if they... I always like to ask them for it. When they don't give it to me, I have to write up a print. The federal regulation requires that I write up an affidavit when they refuse to give me their W-9. So I write up an affidavit, show them a copy of the letter I sent them, and now the IRS gets an extra $50 to go bludgeon these people over their head with, which is fine for me to do, because they're not obeying the public policy on taxes. And, um, so the electric company would be your employer? Not my employer. The electric, company, the electric company is employing the name and social security number. They're using it, aren't they? the credit that goes through. Uh, is it, isn't, the electric company, isn't the electric company using the name and social security number that you put on the application? Because I reported yeah. as a water security account was a source. So, so they're employing the name and social security number. It has nothing to do with me. Tax has everything to do with that name and number account. They only tax the tax transfer E. They're, at, they're actually chartering. They're actually chartering a vessel because every vessel has a name and number. It's all under Admiralty, but we're not going to go down that road. It's just a fun adjunct. So they're employing the name and social security number. You just blew my mind tonight. <laughs> there is a, there's a, there's a, there's a implicates who's liable. Huh? Personal liability for tax. That's what 2603 says. There was a question implied in there. If they're Go ahead. Before the tax. I'm, 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 I'm talking over you. Go ahead. How much credit was transferred to Can you? I ask a question? There's also Go ahead. sessions. You, it'll be on the recording. Okay, two quick questions. 2203. I have $304,319,000 stolen out of the bank here in Dallas, Dallas Comerica Bank. I filed that with the actual construction. With the IRS is stolen money. Property. Can I file on that three hundred four thousand three hundred nineteen dollars? And then you have. But I would. I would actually. Have that is an. Uh, you can. Yes, you can. But what I would do, I would go back. If you have, I don't know how far your statements go back. I would add up the entirety of the banking history, all the statements, all the all the deposits, and all the withdrawals going back and take all your you know, at the top. When you have to get your bank statement, there's a little stub at the top, right? Usually, the stub at the bottom of the original. Okay, I, I, anyone using I did not bank with that bank. It was a commission that they were holding. On 14 gas wells. That's when I sent in my assessment. Okay, well, they, they withheld it. So do you have ev do you have evidence of that amount? Alternate. I mean, 2032. Yes, I do. Alternate valuation. Well, you you take that evidence of that representative of value, that evidence of debt. And right, paid to United States Treasury, given for a patent right, done in good faith, buy, colon, sign your name, name and social security number, uh, me do, uh, sign your name, social security number, and number on the back under it, and say, and, it, and now you've taken that representative of value, which is an obligation of the United States, that pay to the United States Treasury, which is the IMF, which is the IRS, and the credit 1040 via it with a 1040 with an excise tax amount on that line 4C down in the withholding section and send it off to the IRS at, 30, at room 3413 1500 Pennsylvania Avenue and I, I would at this point I would even add remittance remittance on the top of that representative of value and and uh, send it off to them here here's evidence of that here you guys go tax these people you know they'll be happy to get that because they get to hit 13 percent of that okay second second question I want to ask you uh, my remit which is never transferred to the Exchange Commission. I made a full payment. It's $50,000 for payment because it was never transferred. I filed that in state court. Power company, you with the 4490. Go back and assess all, uh, in other words, Bank of America owes uh, $4,200,000. And they just, you know, ignored it. Again, it's closed in the ledger. I agree. Yeah, they closed in the ledger. You have to add both those things. Okay. Because the state that, 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 that dollar amount is part of a bank account, or what is it? amount. That both sides it's of the ledger, uh, even on the Bank of America, owed, they never transferred, all, all the and every payment that I made is fifty thousand dollars. Okay, fine. Because um, it's um, never transferred. Line four, uh, okay, four again, four again four line six I understand. Yeah, that there is. Yeah, there, there's no ten sixty six, and there's no eleven sixty. These mortgages are fake. So the. Uh, and so you have to put together the total amount of credit that was transferred to whomever in the same process.
And you, all you need is the reference, anything that represents the value of that account so the IRS can point to it. Here, you guys admit to it. Here's your statement, Bank of America. You admit to this how much credit was transferred to you. Your statement is now taxable to the to the Bank of America because now I assess the tax by putting on a, on a, 10, on a W-4. And a $10,000 credit. Because they withheld it from you. They never paid you, so that they withheld it from you. So now they have a withholding tax, and they're the transferee and or taxable termination, the trustee of the taxable term. You read 2603. Those are the three parties, and it's never us. Okay, I guess it could be me, but um, generally it's not us normal people. What um, sources are in check? Okay, I appreciate it. I yield. There was a guy in Nebraska had a three million dollar loan with a Mellon Bank, and they were trying to foreclose. So we filled up, took all the representatives of the value, did, did all the pay to the United States Treasury, give them for a patent right, done in good faith, buy, sign the name, name is uh, Social Security number and number on the back, sent it off to the IRS. And five days later, the Mellon Bank lawyer called up on the phone and says, "Who do you guys think you are? You're not employed by the bank. You're going to get in trouble. This is fraud. You're going to get in trouble. Uh, who do you think you are?" And we told him, "Well." If I was in trouble with the IRS, the IRS would be talking to me, but the IRS is talking to you. I suggest you take it up with the IRS. He got mad, hung up. A month later on Labor Day, they called the guy in to a private meeting on the bank on Labor Day, and they made some kind of deal because he won't talk to us anymore about what happened, which really pisses us off, but they probably come to some kind of accommodation now that the uh, $3 million is now taxable to them and shows that he's the tax creditor and they're the tax debtor. <laughs> We don't know what the accommodation had, but they didn't foreclose on his property. <laughs> Great. I love hey, can I ask you one quick question? Go ahead. Do you use the original or the statement, like, you know, your utility statement that comes in the mail? Would you use, you, when you do all this, you don't send the original, would you send a copy? When you write, you know, pay to the United States Treasury, and your signature, and your, uh, your social security number, and all that. You can send the original, you can always print more, all these things are electronic, or you can ask for more statements, I mean. It's yeah, or you could just make a copy. If you send a copy, would that work? A, a copy should work, but why not send the original if you can get another original? It's a triviality. Um, I understand your concern. Your, your concern. I mean, the receipts are, I scan in all my receipts when I have a receipt scanner, and that's scanning all my receipts. That's how I get my receipts going. I have years of receipts going back. It's just tedious. I'm going to do all those at one time to recoup the, the value of my receipts because the receipts, the receipt is a security. It's a security because it represents that someone else was trying to have the receipt is. Compared to the miscellaneous. The security. It shows how much value was put, someone put in their drawer. Well, they have the tax liability. Well, well, even if you do your recruitment of all your receipts, are you going to send the original receipts or are you just going to send copies or scanned copies? I'm going to send them all in. The receipt. I'm not coming. I'm going to send them all in. Just yet. The originals? The original receipt? Like from McDonald's or whatever? I, well, the receipts are going to have pay to the United States Treasury on it. We've been. We've been taught one way. Each one. He's trying to show I have a stamp. That, uh, oh, I got a good stamp idea. plus. So now, stamp plus. I have a little stamp. And, and uh, so the, the, the only part you can't put with the stamp is given for a patent right. That has to be written. Given for a patent right. Look that up in the Bill of Exchange Act in Canada. Canada is part of the five, out of the IMF Commonwealth. We're all Commonwealth. The IMF governs the tax file number, the uh, inland revenue number in New Zealand, the tax file number in Australia. Uh, yeah, the social security number here, the SIN number in, in uh, Canada, the SIN number in, uh, in the Britain, and the ADAR number over in India. Those are all Commonwealth countries, and the IMF governs all the Commonwealth countries. So all the numbers are interchangeable. IRS can use our forms. I can use IRS uh, ATO, Australian Tax Office forms. I have a tax file number from Australia. I have a SIN number from Canada. And so they're all interchangeable. But, um, Any chance we can get a John Doe? On, on a W-4 with the exact you know, verbiage and stuff and the service and the reason for each line being filled out. Yeah. The payoff quote shows both sides of the ledger. But, well, yeah, they just get added. Yeah. Filling out the W-4, you put your name at the top, you put the amount of withholding on line 4C, you put exempt under, read the instructions for the 4C, it says write exempt under 4C. The old one had line 7 when you write exempt. And then you put the employer name at the bottom and you sign your name. I always do done in good faith. The reason I do that, I'm always doing this in good faith. I make sure they know it and done in good faith. 
compliance and um, revenue cut, don't, don't we? And I also add everyone pays their the verbiage on taxes. UCC 3-402, authorized signature of the represented person. Very compliance. And, and uh, to collect I forgot to add that so earlier. Sorry, it's a stamp I use, that little rubber stamp. Authorized signature of the represented person. The only thing you cannot use a stamp for is given for a patent right. Read Canada's Bill of Exchange Act. Well, it's Canadian. Well, no, the Commonwealth countries, they can publish it anywhere and it's published everywhere in the Commonwealth. They hide it that way. They're sneaky like that. But I'm just going to go down. The given for a patent right in New York, if you issue a promissory note or a debt or a, a security instrument without given for a patent right to misdemeanors in Section 552, Kentucky has given for a patent right to felony. Um, just type in your Google, quote, given for a patent right, and you can see where it's mentioned, where it's mentioned, and it applies here in the United States just like it does in Canada. Quote says the amortization and, uh, and the payment schedule. Add both of those together. And when you write but, it, you, but you say we can't use that to say it's given for a You can't use it. You can't use it. You have to handwrite it. Probably. It says has, has, to be print, has to be printed or written, and printed doesn't mean it's part of the form, because I have to do a knowing, intentional, willful act of saying given for a patent right. It can't just be part of the form. That becomes a credit so, okay. books. Because I'm giving it for a patent right, it's a knowing, intentional, willful act. So it requires a man's signature and writing, exactly. either printing or scripting. You go to the W-4, and you say, how okay. extra amount I want withheld from my paycheck? And I write $5,000. That's, that's why Gordon Hall got laid yet. would be zero. That's why Gordon Hall got in trouble. We would have 60000 That's why Gordon Hall got in trouble. And that would have, uh, because he wrote a, he wrote a perfectly good promise, uh, a bill of exchange, or really 60000 And uh, they're going back and forth. Well, it's perfectly good. It's just, it's just not worth anything. And she said, no, it's fraud. They're going back and forth. I'll send that to Gary. And uh, the, the thing I think Gordon Hall didn't put above his signature is given for a patent right. And that's why he was in trouble. Company. $300,000 amortization, $100,000 paid in, so $150,000 total. How would this work for a property that was foreclosed on? I think there not. So they terminated your interest in the property, right? That becomes a credit on their book. Oh, yes, on the street. Did they terminate your interest in the property and threw you off? I think the next size tax, 100% of the price is an excise tax. But they bought it to themselves for $1,800. Did they throw you off? So you were there, and they terminated your tenancy. They threw you on the street, right? That's a termination, right? Yes. In the box. Okay, so that's a taxable termination. So they credit. They got the value. The mortgage company has the value of the note. The servicing company has a retail installment agreement that you're the beneficiary of. And then the court terminated your, your interest in the property. So there's three W-4s there. The court has a taxable termination for the full value of the property. And it is the value of the promissory note that was uh, given to the mortgage company. And then you have a W-4 for the servicing company on both sides of the ledger for all of the dollars and withholding credit that I get to recoup on the excise okay. holding section of the bottom of the What page. if that took place 17 years ago? Did the IRS be paying you that? I don't know what you did. Of course. Have you, have you ever gone to tax return? Well, we got thrown out of a house 17 years ago. Yeah. Are you ever, are you ever not the creditor? The bottom of the 1040, which says... I'm always the creditor. We are the creditor. Then, right? then there is no statute of limitations as the creditor. Okay. That's the same thing. Okay. There's only statute of limitations for the debtors. Okay. Bingo. Okay. okay. I did change, I had, I did super Thank change you. my accounting, yeah. accounting's, uh, from being yeah, for cruel, any any car repossession, there's always there's three parts when they do these taxable terminations for the car or the house, or if they shut down a, uh, like they terminated one of my credit card accounts, I'm going back and recouping all the credit on that credit card. It just takes a lot of time to go back. I mean, there's not, not a lot of time. It just takes, no one told you about the time to go and sit down and do this with everything else, just yeah, keeping toilet paper, paper on the toilet paper roll. Over. No. The tax so, roll over and tax credit right. money. That right now, so the concept is the what I'm talking about. The change in the so the, the concept is um, the end of um, the thing is don't pay me thirty thousand. Uh, well, there's a guy you can listen to the call. Jack. Make sure you chew it over. And uh, make sure you read those code sections I quoted in here. Duke Energy. Uh, you can go back and listen. And, and back then it said on line one, six. Knowing the code, those five code sections plus you said, uh, plus Title Thirty One. Mine. Uh, Thirty. Robert, what happened? Thirty Seven Thirteen. Title Thirty One. Thirty Seven Thirteen. The United States has a priority claim. No, no, no. And so I'm coming in acting as, as an tax assessor on behalf of the United States, United States Treasury, and that's my authority. I'm an agent for the IMF. I actually filed a FAR registration. With, with the Department of Justice as an IMF agent. I, had to I just finished my Rule 2 opinion letter because I want to be recognized as a foreign agent of the IMF. And I want that little account number as my badge number to go back in as an IMF agent. 
demand all the accounting so they don't give me shit for it. That and that's why I intended an extra <laughs> attack. And, and energy came out to your house to make sure your wow. house is efficient that's cool. so they pay as many mm-hmm. taxes as possible. Okay, hold on a second. So now, did everybody, and did everybody have fun tonight? In the middle of winter. <laughs> yes. Oh, two stories tall. But they Thank you, Smoking Baby. You've been on here two hours. Can you close this, though? Hey, 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 Carrie. Carrie, can yes. you define fun? Please define fun. That's what I'm talking about. I, oh, I did. Okay, Smoking Baby. I'm going to meet her after five years of averaging. Hey, thanks for that. But we've been on here for two hours, so, um, you know, I, I don't want to hog everybody's time, but. I want to thank Good you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Okay. Carrie, I'll be sending you an email about uh, going after Chase Bank because they're still being dickheads. And there's been no repercussions? What was that, Matt? Carrie, I'll be I'll be sending you an email to going out to Chase Bank that you know I want to hold them accountable. I, I'm not making I want them to bleed. Oh, I do too. I want to hurt them and hurt them bad. I appreciate that. Okay, but, but uh, I want to thank everybody for coming here. And when I get some stuff, we'll share it with Ed. And if, if anybody's interested, you may not be. What he said tonight. Um, we're not. We didn't. We didn't record this call tonight. Title 15, Section 7. How do we do that, Gary? Well, how do we listen to the calls? Huh? How do we listen to the like, account? You recorded it. You know what? The electricity. Well, we the email. The electricity up front. The invitation. The invitation. And there's the amount of the It's the same process you did. Only there's a different phone number. Then you put in that code, and then it'll it'll drop right in there, and then six will fast forward it, and four will slow down. Is the statement plus the payments? I don't see that. I'm I'm looking at the invitation. Electricity. It's not a bonus to that. There's one question I have for you. We were, you didn't you didn't get to it. It was on the um, we were talking about the homestead exemption. You said you write up something, you put it with the county recorder, and you you uh, take yourself off the household homeowners. Or the uh, homestead exemption. Yeah. Then you said you said there's one there's one word that you you say to them or you you write to them and I've, you never said what that one word was. Well, that's because you haven't paid me for it. Yet. Okay. What happens is if you look at your property tax bill, there's no do- there's no dollar signs on it. So the word is species. Look up S P E C I E. Species definition is is government money. Just a principle. We don't have money. We have no. The returning. So you ask what species the con- the, the county will accept as payment. Don't get into anything else. They can. Not tell you. Like to pass the yeah. uh, will we follow the law? So the only question we have is what species? We owe what species? Well, what about what species? What about, about what species? Once you yeah. ask that, they will not and cannot tell you. Therefore, that puts us in the driver's seat every single time. Utility company. Or no, 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 no. I don't know. So, okay, Carrie, if I could, the name of the top. Carrie, can I ask you one quick question? We've got a bank check. Who is this? Upper left hand corner. Uh, my name is Rick. I'm out in Arizona. I don't know if that makes any difference. I'm on it. I have a friend who got a, 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 a letter that just basically says uh, he, he went to the tax court and got the petition. They rejected it for I have to agree with it and all that sort of thing. They just said it's, you know, it was dismissed for failures to come up on which relief could be granted. So, when I but he still got, in addition to that, though, he got another letter what? from the IRS saying, well, we don't care about what he said before. He said some stuff, and they, they you know, they just, they're basically saying, you still owe us money. You know, it's like they ignore you forever, and I'm just wondering if... Here's, here's what you, basically, here's what you're going to say. Um, I agree with what you said. They don't have jurisdiction. So, if they don't have jurisdiction, I have no jurisdiction, so you owe me $5,000, $20,000, $100,000. Without jurisdiction, we can't owe it. Number two, if, they never, if you never received a notice of deficiency or a notice of determination, 
And that's yes, what in other words for those two issues are. Notice of deficiency, notice of determination. What's another so what's another name for that? Assessment count. That's just no, a claim. Section, no, a claim. A claim a number. Number. You never, wait a second, you never got number, a claim. I've tonight. never given you a and claim. I, uh, you have no claim. You owe me $42,000. How can you owe $42,000 without a claim? I never, are, I never make a claim. They said I owe $42,000. I might, but where's the claim? The proof? Where's your proof of that? Once I do that, they don't know what to do with it. See? And then if worse comes to worse, you can always appeal it on the grounds. They admit that it never gets Given so, me a claim. Yeah. Now they're asking for forty-two thousand dollars. I'm uh, confused. Say credit, isn't it? Yeah, that's a twelve B six. So you state a claim. It's, it's ah, ain't that something? I agree. Yep. I I agree with what they said. I agree. There's never been a claim. So without a claim, how can I have a forty-two thousand to the United States? They name a claim which would be granted is rule twelve B six. The United States Treasury. Right. So and okay, if you never stated a claim, to the United States Treasury. I'm not stating a claim. I will not state a claim. You owe me fifty dollars. How do you owe me fifty dollars if I don't have a claim? Okay, I'm a contractor. I do. Do an estimate. After I'm done, I invoice it. There's your notice of deficiency, notice of determination. There it is, right there. There's my claim. See, in other words, if you don't owe it, how can you owe it if there's no claim? I agree with what you're saying. I never received a notice. See, then I go back to I never received a notice of deficiency, notice of determination, parentheses, the claim. As the court agreed with me, therefore, then you write your order, just like Smoking Baby says. And we write the order saying, since I never received the claim, I can't owe 42000 or I can't owe whatever, so this must be dismissed on, for lack of jurisdiction on the grounds. I never received a claim for years 2000 to 2020, whatever. That's the outstanding tax. We've been transferred $1,000 from the Secretary of State. I've got a property tax. Yep. Because I paid the tax, thank you, Gary. Thank you. The property. My when pleasure. I, I hope you guys enjoy. Thank you. Or zebra Thanks, Gary. It's a uh, dollar. But I have to pay that. The next call will be the twenty-third. Nine cents. The total price is the next. Bring that dollar and nine cents. I get a receipt. Goodbye. The receipt is titled to the goods, and it's also a it's also a security. Those receipts we get back from the from these stores can also be redeemed because it's evidence of value. So because it's representative of value, I can take all my receipts, send it off to the Treasury with a Form 1522 to recoup the value of all my receipts. The receipts are redeemable because I'm the creditor. I'm never a debtor. So anything that represents value, I get to assess and recoup. It's the idea that I'm the creditor as the first legal, as the first big jump, and then that both sides of the ledger on every account are tied to the Social Security credit and the transferee has a tax liability. When I, when I deposit $10,000 in my bank, I have a $10,000 deposit on one side, then I write a check for $1,000 against it. Well, most people think they take $1,000 off the deposit side. Well, they don't, because if you look on your statement, you have deposits and withdrawals. So every time I write a check, every time I write a check, it puts something on the withdrawal side, and, it, and it's tied to the social. So the difference between the stack is 9,000. I write another $1,000 check, um, and it, it Every time I sign my name, it's a new issue of credit from the Treasury. I'm authorizing a new issue of credit from the Treasury because only I can authorize issues of credit because the government's bankrupt. So when I write another check, the difference in the stack is 8000 So it's the difference in stacks that both sides of the stacks are tied to the social because the banks take these deposits and the checks and they, they go out and they, they, they monetize all these checks we write and the CAFR funds and everything. So both sides of the ledger are my credit. Now I add them both sides together, and now I assess how much credit was transferred to them that they never would paid me back. The credit that they never paid me back was withheld from me, so the withholding certificate is a certificate I use. A certificate is a security, by the way. Birth certificates are securities, otherwise it would be a birth notice. So these, the withholding certificate is an assessment of how much credit was transferred to these line eight person with a name and account number at the bottom of the, of the W-4. Right. It's, it, it's, come, it's getting over the idea that I'm never a debtor. I am the source of the credit, and now I can assess how much credit was transferred because I was interested in acquiring something, and by paying their excise taxes, how I get legal title to, the, to that thing I was interested in, and then I can take that receipt and redeem the receipt to recoup all my credit. Can I ask a question for clarification? Sure. Yeah, so uh, earlier you said 
uh, if you're working for a company, you can take the uh, the amount of payment, say that you use the example $5,000 a month, and put that on line 4C of the W-4, and not get in, not receive any pay during the year, and then on the at the end of the year when you fill out your tax form, you claim that as withholding. Well, that's, and, and that, that, that's an example I use to show that that line four C turns into a tax credit, a withholding credit that we get to recoup. When I do, when I go work for a company, I typically use a form W four V, and I say on line seven, stop withholding any state or federal income tax. But if you use a normal W four, when they send you the W two, which is an em- employee withholding that's under the 1939 federal tax act that says employees have to work for the government in a trader business look up trader business under 7701 of title 26 someone who holds public office well the uh, the w-2 is the company's attempt to push the excise tax onto you as income i take the w-2 and use 4850 to form 4852 and recast the w-2 income as excise tax that goes at the bottom of the form I re- the form. 4852, the form 4852, I recast. Pete Henderson what? uses that. He, he uses the same form, but in a different system. I don't know what system it is, but the 4852 recast as an excise tax. I don't, Pete Henderson probably doesn't use the W-4 to recoup all the credit. That's true. But uh, he's, no, brilliant yeah. what he, he's brilliant in what he's done so far. I, I really, I, I read his work. That's where I got the 4852 from in the first place. Um, yeah. that, that, we, we don't have, I can't have taxable income when I'm the source of the credit. It's retarded. I'm going to tax me to get it back to me. And it's, I'm only taxable if I don't tell the IRS who I, who I transfer the credit to. Then I become an agent of on tort and I'm liable for the tax, the excise yeah, tax. Question. So going back to the $5,000, uh, putting the $60,000 per year on the w, uh, W-4 line 4C, I think you said. I paid 5000 uh, a month, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, and then taking that sixty thousand dollars at the end of the year and putting it on your ten forty and claiming that it was withholding and then requesting the money back is, is that? Did I understand that correctly? That's the example I use to show everything you're paying to the electric company is a withholding that you have okay. to recoup. So, so going back to the Walmart situation with a mask where you uh, where you say you, you charge them $10,000 for wearing the mask and $5,000 for something else. I can't remember what it, it was, but... It, it's, five, it's 5 and 15. That, you, I could charge more. It's 5 and 15. <laughs> yeah, so five, 5 and 15. So you put $20,000 on the line 4C, uh, send it to the IRS, and then at the end of the year, can you put that $20,000 on, um, on your... Uh, your 1040 and when I claim when I do when I take when I take the W-4 I, I take every receipt and on the receipt I put a little check mark I put a little check on it to carry you know a little check on it to say that it's been checked and then uh, and then that uh, it's it's for the goods and services supplied on the top of the W-4 uh, or I, now I include a statement with it the old one but anyway this and I, I send an invoice and for the full amount and that invoice is paid to the United States Treasury, and then I put attach all the receipts, and on line 4C is the, how I put the goods and services supplied to Walmart by wearing apparel according to their employee policy. That's where I do my assessment in line 4C for every time I went to Walmart last year. They ordered me to pay, they ordered me to do it, and I accepted their order, and now they gotta pay for it. So okay. I, because we didn't agree on the value of my goods and services, I do my own assessment of the value of those goods and services that I supplied to them under their employee manual as a de facto employee, but they never paid me for my goods and services, so it's a withholding. They withheld my pay. And that's and I include the receipts to show I was there. I'm not gonna make up crazy shit like that. I'm not gonna lie to the IRS because I want the I want I want to I have no reason to lie to the IRS. I'm the creditor. Right. Um, and and then I and then you take the W four with the receipts, with the invoice, with a 1040V, and, send, and and a 1040, the bottom of the 1040, I'm filling out the bottom of the 1040 for, every, you can send in multiple 1040s all year long to do the assessment, and send that off to room 3413 at 1500 Pennsylvania Avenue, that's the uh, remittance office and bills of exchange office, and on the receipts I write, pay to United States Treasury, each receipt, pay to, that little stamp, pay to United States Treasury and sign it. And now that okay. receipt, with the, I was going to say that 1040 uh, with a credit on the bottom would go to the U.S. Treasury? The withholding on the bottom. Yeah, right, okay. The withhold, it's withholding for them, it's 
credit for me, but into the withholding okay. section because they withheld my credit. And okay. now, now the corporations have to pay their fair share of taxes because they're bankrupt, and now they have to pay. <laughs> That's cool. That's hilarious. If I, and if I don't, if I don't tell them, you know, all these corporations have huge buildings. I mean, like Google and all this shit. I'm also assessing a tax against Google, and tw Twitter suspended my account, so I got their 10K, got their EIN number, and I'm doing a pro rata share of all the profits they made based on my account and how many accounts they had, how much profit they made, and I'm going to, because they terminated my account, that's a taxable termination, so I'm doing a W4 against Twitter to assess the amount of value I contributed to them by having an account with them, and now and now they get to pay uh, I'm, I'm recouping my termination amount. Let them argue. Go ahead and argue with the IRS. I'm just the assessor, and you can't bitch at me. I'm, go argue with the IRS. Here's the proof of, the, of my taxable termination. Now I get to determine and do an assessment of the value of that account based on their 10K, which has their EIN number, by the way. That's how you find EIN numbers. Yeah, now just, I'm gonna just, think if we, just think if we had a million or 10 million people doing the same thing you're doing. They, but there's, they, even, a, there's, even, there's, even, a, there's even a better thing. All these false statements that by the FDA, CDC, NIH, Mr. Fuki, all these people making false statements under t under Consumer Protection 15, 1692E, false statements have a penalty under 78FS of Title 15 of $25 million. I am in the process of putting together evidence of false statements, and I'm going to ask that each one of those assholes who are making false statements, which are damaging the consumers under Consumer Protection and hitting them with $25 million withholding, because they made a false statement, because now there's a, there's, a, there's a penalty that applies to them that they've never paid me, so that's a withholding. And I'm going to assess the withholding of $25 million. Now they're going to be paying 13% taxes. <laughs> and to wipe them. And, and if, every, if we got 100 million people to do it, it would wipe these pharmaceutical companies off the map. Oh, that would be fun. Mm-hmm. I think there's and a lot you don't think there's going to be any kind of legal time. What, because I'm telling the IRS that someone owes them money? What are they going to do? <laughs> yeah. Well, they should They're be happy, happy but... But no, no, why, would the, why would the IRS get mad at me for them giving them the ammunition? The IRS is in this for profit. They're a for-profit foreign corporation, giving the, and they own all these Social Security numbers and EIN numbers from the IMF. Uh, IMF issues them, and so the IRS issues them and Social Security Administration. So my telling them credit that was due to the to this foreign corporation. The IMF was created by the Exchange Stabilization Fund in 1934. The Exchange Stabilization Fund is a corporate soul at the basement of the Federal Reserve Building in New York, which is the United States. So all these numbers are foreign, and they're here for profit. And even the president is not is not immune from taxes. Neither is Pelosi. All, no one's immune from taxes, and no one's immune from the postal court regulations because those are global governance. And it's because the Exchange Civilization Fund created the IMF and the World Bank as straw men for their corporate soul, which is the Exchange Civilization Fund, where they hold all the gold in the basement of the Federal Reserve Building in New York. So the IRS, what, what the IRS going to get mad at me? They don't. IRS doesn't care about these corporations. They're happy to go scoop up any amount of money from these corporations as long as we tell them we transfer the tax to them, and because. We, because we're kings of the nation, I know King, Larry doesn't, uh, Gary doesn't like that, but I'm the, because we're kings of the nation, we assess the taxes and have our agencies go out and recoup our taxes for us. Okay, so if the average guy, you're using your little 5000 a month, 60000 a year, and puts that on line 25C, or, you know, or it's under not, federal not, income okay, tax code, Okay, again, don't worry about your income because you don't have a tax on the income. Kerry has shown that we don't have a twenty. We don't have an assessment right. or determination. No, I'm just uh, I'm just dealing with the W four line four C sixty thousand dollar figure of don't pay me sixty thousand. I'm reporting it to the IRS. Okay, so but, but, that, that, but we're not that, that we're, we're not talking, like, we're not talking uh, about. No, let me ask you my let me ask okay. you my question, then you can explain how if I'm wrong or whatever. So yeah, I get this sixty thousand. I've done it on a W four. Notified the proper parties. Send it off to no, the. Uh, the no, no, IRS. There's only one party. There's only one party. You, your job is to order, keep records, and report to the IRS, not to the corporation. You send this to the IRS. Okay, that's where the W four goes. All right. So then I've done all that, and now at the end of the year, I'm going to file my ten forty form, and it's going to have no income for wages or salary or any of that sort of nonsense. It's just going to have a figure. 
under the federal income tax withheld on the back of the form, on page two of the 1040 form, it says $60,000, no. taxes due zero, refund amount $60,000. Would you actually get that refund, or would you just get a bucket of grief and they try to come and hassle you or whatever? I'm, I have the conviction. It'll, but, number one, your example is flawed. If you're actually working for the man, you will get a normal W-2. If you want to you get paid nothing, you can add that amount, but you won't have any, have any toilet paper money for the year. That, that example, because most people know about employment, that that example is to show how much credit was, how much credit was transferred to that electric company that they didn't pay you. I use that $5,000 online for you to see just as an example of how most people know that if you overpay your taxes, you get a recoupment at the end of the year. That happens. You know that happens. So that, right. that's not even a, and so that's, that's a conviction you can stand on when you do the same thing yes. for every other social security base, name a numbered account administered by a fiduciary corporation who has liability for the taxes. So, and again, I'm just telling the IRS, here's my accounting and, and that it good, done in good faith. I always write done in good faith when I do these things and, and I ask them if you have a better way to do it, if you see any corrections I need to make, please, please let me know. I'm here to help. My intention is to be in voluntary compliance with the Internal Revenue Code. And in furtherance of my intention to be in voluntary compliance with the Internal Revenue Code, here's my assessment. Please let me know if you need any help so I can do, do a better job for you so that we can make sure everyone pays their fair share of taxes. After all, we all wish to be in voluntary compliance with the Internal Revenue Code, don't we? Thank you for your assistance. I look forward to hearing from you. I write letters. I, I did this back in 2010, and the IRS has been no grief at all. And I don't report these W-4s to the corporation because my duty is to report to the IRS. Right. So I report all these forms to the IRS. I might do labor for these corporations, but I don't have a duty to report anything to that corporation. The corporation has a duty to report to the IRS just like I do. And it okay. removes us, it, re, it, re, it removes me from having a controversy and going to war with these corporations, which is why they set up this administrative system the way it is. We have a third party overarching global entity that now comes in as an enforcement agency to make sure everyone behaves so that we don't go to war and start shooting each other, shooting each other again like we did under Lincoln's bullshit. But, uh, and so that's why it's set up this way with this administrative overlay so we don't go to war. Okay, so could the average man or woman that actually was out there working at Walmart or whatever, could they take their their, their monthly, that's what they get paid just once a month, they take their monthly check and put the withholding amount on there the, on the line 4C of the W-4 and send it off to the IRS so that it's, here's my accounting, because uh, that comes, comes back to them, right? That with, The amount that was taken out of their pay was is like prepaid, but you should get it back at the end of the year. When you, that paycheck went to the bank. You're going to do the assessment on the bank with a W-4, all the deposits, all the withdrawals. If you're working for an employer, do not fuck with the employer. You will get fired. Yeah, yeah, oh, I understand. That's, uh, that's why I'm asking these. So they might seem like silly questions, but if you're trying to employ this, you got to kind of, I just want to know more about it. That, that's the bottom well, line. Say, you're, you're, you're hitched on this. Uh, if you if you want to get a zero paycheck and authorize it withholding, go ahead and do that, and you can recoup it at the end of the year. But right now, when I get paid, there's an automatic deposit. I never get paid. It goes directly to the bank. So my employer becomes a transfer or transferring my, my, the late, the value of my contributions as to a skip person. The bank is the skip person. The employer skipped me, sent the deposit to the bank. So the, the employer is the transfer or transferring to a skip person because it didn't pay me. It went to the bank as a skip person. So the employer is liable to the, liable for that amount of taxes, which is the entire amount. Under 2603, and then, then I do the assessment on the bank. All the deposits, all the withdrawals get to W-4. But I do not screw with my employer by playing silly games because it's going right. to freak them out, and you're going to become a squeaky wheel, and then you'll be fucked. But um, so I understand. I understand. <laughs> That's great. But, but you could do it, though, to the, to you, with the bank each, uh, I don't know, periodically. Would you do it once a year, once a month, once a quarter? How, how would you do it? You can do quarterly filings if you want to, but at the end, of, there's only one 1040 for the year. I mean, there's only yeah. one final 1040 for the year, so yeah, yeah. you could do you could yeah. do a quarterly. You could do quarterly just to make your paperwork less onerous at the end of the year. That's fine, but I, I just have to make sure the IRS knows who's receiving Social Security sourced credit from applications for credit that was transferred to these corporations, creating a brand new person, name and numbered account to person, just like the Social Security cards of person, and I have and it's my duty to assess the taxes. 
to tell them how much credit was transferred and how much credit was withheld. And, of course, I got the interest up front and tangible goods and interest up front. And that, that's my duty to report to the IRS. Keep re- order, keep records, and report to the IRS. And so that's what right. I do. That's true. I want to make, because after all, we all wish to be involuntary compliance with the Internal Revenue Code, don't we? I use that all the time in my letters. Yeah. I think it's so if we're unclear about any part of this, is how do we, how do we uh, find out the details uh, of this, the minutia that you're talking about? How well, do come somebody, like, get in contact with you or? Well, or no, next week, uh, over the week, start chewing it over because most people don't yeah. realize they think they're a debtor and they think they, you know, it's just silly. Um, so after chewing about it, you have, if it, it comes down to having the conviction of the heart of knowing that I'm the source of the credit. My signature cre- authorizes the, is- the creation of new money on that credit application. Every time I sign my name, I'm authorizing new credit to be issued. And that's, that's because in 1933, the United States went bankrupt, and we gave them three duties. Write treaties, keep a navy, and issue, and issue coin and currency. Well, when we went bankrupt, they took away the currency printing from the United States because they never paid their debts every 70 years. So... If, if we're the pe- if we the people authorize that authority to issue coin and currency, and they no longer do it, well, then it reverts back to our authority to issue coin and currency, and that's what I do when I sign my signature. I'm authorizing a new disbursement of credit from the Treasury, mm-hmm. and it becomes an obligation of the United States. So, that's knowing that piece right there. My signature authorizes the issue of credit off a of UCC right. Article Five letter of credit. I'm a little, I'm a little big on the accounting, the double ledger thing. I need to study up on that a little more. Terry, okay, but you turned in, you, you, turn, you turned in, you turned in a credit application. The credit application is an Article Five letter of credit that created the account. It's just called with the electric account. Everyone has electricity, and every month they send you a statement in the mail. That statement is a positive amount. That positive amount is not a debt. That's an actual negotiable instrument. Most of us just go ahead and pay both sides of the ledger. So I get a $100 electric bill, I pay $100 out of my Social Security-based checking account. So now the now the books are balanced. You have a thousand, $100 of usage on one side and a $100 contribution on the other side. At the end of the year, both sides are tied to the both sides are tied to a Social Security linked account. You add both sides of the ledger because they're both Social Security tied linked account. So it's Five thousand dollars in electricity and statements, and five thousand dollars electricity and payment. That's ten thousand dollars of Social Security based account that was that that the electric company has in their coffers. So that ten thousand dollars is the amount of credit that was transferred to the electric company that goes online for C to assess how much how much credit I did not get paid back was withheld or additional amount I, I want withheld from my paycheck. The, the W four can either be a draft against the account or an assessment of how much principal, how much credit was transferred. It's a, it's a, the W four has like three or four different functions, but uh, and so that ten thousand dollars is how much credit was transferred to the electric account because their statement admits it. My checks prove it, and the, when you get the final statement at the end of the year from the electric company, it says amount of usage and amount of payments. They admit to having that much credit. And you add those together, put it on online 4C, the W-4, take the coupon, take the statements, and the statements are representative of value, right? The statement represents value, there's $100 on it, right? Pay to the United States Treasury, done in good faith, sign your name, you so pay to the United States Treasury, Treasury, given for a patent right, look up given for a patent right, it's in the Bill of Exchange Act, given for a patent right, gun in good faith, buy, sign your name, name and social security number, put, put them all together, put a staple in them because that makes it a form. A form has a wire in it. Attach it to the 1040V and, and, then, and then the 1040, put how much withholding is on there on the 1040. So the IRS, because now the, I don't sign the 1040, I just make it a statement. And they have all the statements, and some of the IRS is getting their statements, like we just talked about. Now the IRS knows who to, who to go after to pay that thirteen percent, and and who to who to credit the uh, recoupment for. On so the W I, under, I understand that your point is to ha- get them to pay their fair share into the national debt. What is my benefit on something like that? You have a withholding credit. You have a withholding credit. Source. How does that work? Of, of the, what? Given that scenario, scenario you just said, ten thousand at the end of the year. That's what's my withholding credit? Is it thirteen thousand of that? Twenty thousand. No, 
thirteen percent is what the what the employer plays. The ten thousand dollar credit, that ten thousand dollars is the amount of withholding credit that has. Goes on your ten forty. And what happens with that credit? Does it get paid back to me, or does it sit there in an account? It depends whether or not you file a ten forty or not. Okay. What, what was the lady going to say? Wait, and on the W four, on the ten forty like for the ten forty ten thousand. Is that where you sign, and then the employer is, you know, uh, Con Ed or whoever, and then what do you put for the first date of employment and the employer identification number? The, okay, the the day I opened the opened that account is the date the contract was created, and twelve years. What it doesn't matter, whenever it was, and uh, so the IRS knows how, how far back to go and start doing an assessment. And then, then as far as the EIN number, you can write them a letter. I, I said, said, letting them know I need your 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 W nine or W eight, and there's a fifty dollar fine if you don't cough it up to me. Or you can go online to these corporations, type in the corporation's name into the Security Exchange Commission, and put in the Comed ten K. And when you pull up the ten K from the Security Exchange Commission, it has Comed's EIN number right there. You can find the okay. EIN number. They have to provide it to you if ask for it. It's a fifty dollar fine or a five hundred dollar fine if they don't give it to you. And if they, I always like to ask them for it. When they don't give it to me, I write up a. The federal regulation requires that I write up an affidavit when they refuse to give me the W nine. So I write up an affidavit, show them a copy of the letter I sent them, and now the IRS gets an extra fifty dollars to go bludgeon these people over their head with, which is fine for me to do because they're not obeying the public policy on taxes. And. Um, so the electric so, company would be your employer. N not my employer. The, no. the electric company. The electric company is employing the name and social security number. They're using it, aren't they? Isn't is, is the electric company? Isn't the electric company using the name and social security number that you put on the application? Yeah. So, so they're employing the name and social security number. It has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with that name and number to count. They're at. They're actually chartering. They're actually chartering a vessel because every vessel has a name and number. It's all under admiralty, but we're not going to go down that road. It's just a fun adjunct. So they're employing the name and social security number. You just blew my mind tonight. So. There was a, there was a man, there was, huh? There was a man. What question? Go ahead. I'm, I'm I'm talking over you. Go ahead. Can I ask a question? Go ahead. Okay, two quick questions. I had three hundred four thousand, three hundred nineteen thousand dollars stolen out of a bank in Dallas, Comerica Bank. I filed that with IRS's stolen money. Can I file on that three hundred four thousand, three hundred nineteen dollars? Well, I would. I would actually. Uh, you can. Yes, you can. But what I would do, I would go back. If you have, st I don't know how far your statements go back. I would add up. The entirety of the banking history, all the statements, all the de all the deposits, and all the withdrawals going back and ha take all your you know, at the top when you have to get your bank statement. There's a little stub at the top, right? Usually it's a stub at the bottom of the okay, company. I, I I did not bank with that bank. It was a commission that they were holding on 14 gas wells. Okay, well they, they withheld it. So do you have ev do you have evidence of that amount? Yes, I do. Well, you you take that evidence of that representative of value, that evidence of debt, right? Paid to United States Treasury, given for a patent right, done in good faith. Buy colon sign your name, name and Social Security number. Uh, I mean, the, by, sign your name, Social Security number, and number on the back under it, and say. Pay, and, it, and now you've taken that evidence, representative of value, which is an obligation of the United States. Said pay to the United States Treasury, which is the IMF, which is the IRS, and. 1040 via with a 1040 with an excise tax amount on that line 4C down in the withholding section and send it off to the IRS at, 30, at room 3413, 1500 Pennsylvania Avenue. And I, I would, at this point, I would even add remittance, remittance on the top of that representative of value and and uh, send it off to them. Here, Here's evidence of that. Here you guys go tax these people. You know, they'll be happy to get that because they get to hit 13% of that. Okay, second second question I want to ask you. Uh, my limit, which was never transferred to the Exchange Commission, I made 84 payments. It's $50,000 per payment because it was never transferred. 
I filed that in the state court uh, with the 4490. Uh, in other words, Bank of America owes uh, 4200000 And they just, you know, ignored it. That, again, they, have, you know, the state court. They, I agree. The court, $4.2 million. Okay. That, 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 that dollar amount is part of a bank account, or what is it? It's a, it's a Bank of America. Oh, they never transferred, and every payment that I made is fifty thousand dollars. Okay, fine. Because um, it was never transferred. Okay, again, the I understand. Yeah, that there is. Yeah, that there's no ten sixty six, and there's no eleven sixty. These mortgages are fake. So the uh, and so you have to put together the total amount of credit that was transferred to whomever, and the same process. And you, all you need is the represent anything that represents the value of that account so the IRS can point to it. Here, you guys admit to it. Here's your statement, Bank of America. You admit to this how much credit was transferred to you. Your statement is now taxable to the to the Bank of America because now I assess the tax by putting on a, on a, 10, on a W-4. Because they withheld it from you. They never paid you, so that they withheld it from you. So now they have a withholding tax, and they're the transferee and or taxable termination the trustee of the tax return. You read twenty six oh three. Those are the three parties, and it's never us. Okay, I guess it could be me, but um, generally, it's not us normal people. Um, okay, appreciate it. I yield. There was a guy in uh, Nebraska had a three million dollar loan with a Mellon Bank, and they were trying to foreclose. So we filled up, took all the representatives of the value, to, did all the pay to the United States Treasury, give them for a patent right, done in good faith, buy, sign the name, name is uh, Social Security number and number on the back, sent it off to the IRS, and five days later the Mellon Bank lawyer called up on the phone and says, who, who do you guys think you are? You're not employed by the bank. You're going to get in trouble. This is fraud. You're going to get in trouble. Uh, who do you think you are? And we told him, well, if I was in trouble with the IRS, the IRS would be talking to me. But the IRS is talking to you. I suggest you take it up with the IRS. <laughs> he got mad, hung up. A month later on Labor Day, they called the guy in to a private meeting on the bank on Labor Day, and they made some kind of deal because he won't talk to us anymore about what happened, which really pisses us off. But they probably come to some kind of accommodation now that the uh, $3 million is now taxable to them and shows that he's the tax creditor and they're the tax debtor. <laughs> we don't know what the accommodation had, but they didn't foreclose on his property. <laughs> hey, can I ask you one quick question? Go ahead. Do you use the original or statement, like, you know, your utility statement that comes in the mail? Would you use, you, when you do all this, you don't send the original, would you send a copy when you, write, you know, pay to the United States Treasury and your signature and your uh, your Social Security number and all? You can, you can send the original. You can always print more. All these things are electronic. Or you can ask for more statements. I mean, it's yeah. not... Or you could just make a copy. If you send a copy, would that work? A, a copy should work, but when I send the original, if you can get another original. It, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a triviality. Um I understand your concern. Your, your concern. I mean, the receipts are. I, I scan in all my receipts when I have a receipt scanner, and that's scanning all my receipts. That's how I get my receipts going. I have years of receipts going back. It's just tedious. I'm going to do all those at one time to recoup the the value of my receipts because the receipts the receipt is a security. It's a security because it represents that someone else was has is, the receipt is a security. It shows how much value would put someone put in their drawer. Yeah. But you know, even if you do the recruitment of all your receipts, are you going to send the original receipts, or are you just going to send copies or a scanned copy? I'm just send them all in. The receipts. I'm just send them all in. The originals, the original sure. receipt, like from McDonald's or whatever. Because well, the receipts are going to have "Pay to United States Treasury" on it. Each one. I have a stamp. Oh, that's I got great. Good stamp idea. plus. Stamp plus. I have a little stamp. And uh, the, the, the only part you can't put with a stamp is given for a patent right. That has to be written, given for a patent right. Look that up in the Bill of Exchange Act in Canada. Canada is part of the five, out of the IMF Commonwealth. We're all Commonwealth. The IMF governs the tax file number, the uh, inland revenue number in New Zealand, the tax file number in Australia, the social security number here, the SIN number in, in uh, Canada, the SIN number in, uh, in the Britain and the Adar number over in India. Those are all Commonwealth countries, and the IMF governs all the Commonwealth countries. So all the numbers are interchangeable. IRS can use our forms. I can use IRS uh, ATO Australian tax office forms. I have a tax file number from Australia. I have a send number from Canada. 
and so they're all interchangeable. But um, any chance we can get a John Doe on on a W four with the exact you know, verbiage and stuff, and the reason for each line being filled out? Yeah, template. But well, gently filling out the W four, you put your name at the top, you put the amount of withholding on line four C. You put exempt under, read the instructions for the 4C. It says write exempt under 4C. The old one had line seven when you write exempt. And then you put the employer name at the bottom and you sign your name. I always do done in good faith. I'm always doing this in good faith. I make sure they know it, done in good faith. And um, I also add the verbiage on UCC 3-402, authorized signature of the represented person. And... Uh, I forgot to add that earlier. Sorry, it's a stamp I use, that little rubber stamp, authorized signature of the representative person. The only thing you cannot use a stamp for is given for a patent right. Read Canada's Bill of Exchange Act. Well, it's Canadian. Well, no, the Commonwealth countries, they can publish it anywhere, and it's published everywhere in the Commonwealth. They hide it that way. They're sneaky like that. But um, so given for a patent right in New York, if you issue a promissory note or a, debt or a, a security instrument without given for a patent right to misdemeanors in Section 552, Kentucky has given for a patent right to felony. Um, just type in your Google, quote, given for a patent right, and you can see where it's mentioned, where it's mentioned, and it applies here in the United States just like it does in Canada. And, uh... But you, but you say we can't use that stamp as given for patent right. You can't use it. You can use it. You have to handwrite it. Oh, it says it has, oh, oh. Has, to be print, has to be printed or written. And printed doesn't mean it's part of the form because I have to do a knowing, intentional, willful act of saying given for a patent right. It can't just be part of the form. So okay. because I'm giving it for a patent right, it's a knowing, intentional, willful act. So it requires a man's oh. signature handwriting, either printing or scripting. Okay. That's why Gordon Hall got laid yet. That's why Gordon Hall got in trouble. Because, that's why Gordon Hall got in trouble because uh, he wrote a he wrote a perfectly good promise uh, a bill of exchange or like, and uh, they're going back and forth. Well, it's perfectly good. It's just it's just not worth anything. And she, and she said, "No, it's fraud." They're going back and forth. I'll send that to Kerry. And uh, the the thing I think Gordon Hall didn't put above his signature is given for a patent right, and that's why he was in trouble. <laughs> I have a question. Go ahead. How would this work for a property that was foreclosed on? So they terminated your interest in the property, right? Your ass on the street. Yeah. No, no, the lady. Did they did they terminate your interest in the property and threw you off? No, I don't know what you mean by that, but they bought it to themselves for $1,800. Did they throw you off the did, so you were there, and they terminated your tenancy. They threw you on the street, right? That's a termination, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so that's a taxable termination. So they, they got the value. The mortgage company has the value of the note. The servicing company has a retail installment agreement that you're the beneficiary of. And then the court terminated your your interest in the property. So there's three W-4s there. The court has a taxable termination for the full value of the property, the value of the promissory note that was uh, given to the mortgage company, and then you have a W-4 for the servicing company on both sides of the ledger for all of them. Okay. What if that took place 17 years ago? I don't know what you did. Well, we got thrown out of a house 17 years ago. Are you ever? Are you ever not the creditor? I'm always the creditor. We are the creditor. Then, then there is no statute of limitations as the creditor. There's only statute. Okay. Of, there's only statute of limitations for the debtors. Bingo. Okay. Super. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. For any any car repossession, there's always there's three parts when they do these taxable terminations for the car or the house, or if they shut down a. Uh, like they terminated one of my credit card accounts. I'm going back and recouping all the credit on my credit card. It just takes a lot of time to go back. I mean, there's not, not a lot of time. It just takes time to go and sit down and do this with everything else, just keeping toilet paper on the toilet paper roll, you know. So, right. so the so concept is... Great information. So, so the, the concept is... Again, you know, uh, well... You can listen to the call, make sure you chew it over, and make sure you read those code sections I quoted in here. Uh, you can go back and listen. And, and when, knowing the code, those five code sections, plus, plus
plus Tyba 31, uh, 30, 37, 13, 37, 13, the United States has a priority claim. And so I'm coming in acting as, as an tax assessor on behalf of the United States, United States Treasury, and that's my authority. I'm an agent for the IMF. I actually filed a FAR registration with the Department of Justice as an IMF agent, and I just finished my Rule 2 opinion letter because I want to be recognized as a foreign agent of the IMF, and I want that little account number as my badge number to go back in as an IMF agent, demand all the accounting so they don't give me shit, and that's what I intend to do next. <laughs> wow. That's cool. Huh? Mm-hmm. Okay, hold on a second. Now, did everybody... Did everybody have fun tonight? <laughs> yes. Thank you, smoking baby. We've been on here two hours. Can you close this though? Hey, hey, Carrie. Carrie, can yes. you define fun? Please That's define what fun. I'm talking about. I, oh, I hit. Okay, smoking baby. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thank you for that. But we've been on here for two hours, so um, you know I, I don't want to hog everybody's time, but I want to thank you, like smoking baby. Carrie, I'll be sending you an email about uh, going after Chase Bank because they're still being dickheads. What was that? Carrie, I'll be I'll be sending you an email to going after Chase Bank. That you know, I want to hold them accountable. I I, I want them to bleed. <laughs> oh, I do too. I want to hurt them and hurt them bad. I appreciate that. So, okay. But, but uh, I want to thank everybody for coming here. And when I get some stuff, we'll share it with Ed. And if, if, if anybody's interested, you may not be. What he said tonight, um, we're not. We didn't. We didn't record this call tonight. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We did. We did. So go back and listen to it. Take the notes. Get some intelligence. How do we do that, Gary? What? How do we listen to the calls? Huh? How do we listen to the like? You recorded the email. Where do I what? read the email? What do we do? is go to the invitation. The invitation in there says if it's the same process you did, only there's a different phone number. Then you put in that code, and it'll go, it'll drop you right in there. And then the six will sp fast forward it, and four will slow it down. I don't I don't see that. I'm I'm looking at the invitation. It's on the bottom. It's on the bottom. Don't find it. It's it's down. Down. It's it's down. Down. That invitation. Read it again. Well, there. If you have any questions, That's get a hold of the middle of the head. Head. Hey, Carrie. Yes, sir. There's uh, there's one question I have for you. We you didn't you didn't get to it. It was on the um, when we were talking about the homestead exemption. You said you write up something, you put it with the county recorder, and you you uh, take yourself off the ho household homeowners or the uh, homestead exemption. Yeah. Then you said you said there's one there's one word that you you say to them or you you write to them and i you never said what that one word was well that's because you haven't paid me for it yet <laughs> <laughs> no okay what happens is if you look at your property tax bill there's no dot there's no dollar signs on it yep. so the word is specie look up s-p-e-c-i-e specie -E. <laughs> definition is is government money okay. we don't have money we have no so you ask what specie the, con the, the county will accept as payment. Don't get okay. into anything else. They cannot tell you. Therefore, yeah. when we file the lawsuit, the only question we have is what specie? We well, owe oh, what specie? Well, what about what specie? What about, about what specie? Once you yeah. ask that, they will not and cannot tell you. Therefore, that puts us in the driver's seat every single time. Got it. So, okay. Carrie, if I could, Carrie, can I ask you one quick question? Who is this? Uh, my name is Rick. I'm out in Arizona. I don't know if that makes any difference. But I just, <laughs> I have a friend who got a, 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 a letter that just basically says uh, he he went to the tax court and got the petition. They rejected it for I have to agree with it and all that sort of thing. They just said it's you know. It was dismissed from failures to came upon which relief could be granted. So, but he still got, in addition to that, though, he got another letter from the IRS saying, well, we don't care about what he said before. He sent some stuff. And they, they, you know, they just, they're basically saying, you still owe us money. You know, it's like they ignore you forever. Okay. And I'm just I, wondering if. 
here's here's what you basically here's what you're going to say. Um, I agree with what you said. They don't have jurisdiction. So if they don't have jurisdiction, I have no jurisdiction. So you owe me five thousand, twenty thousand, a hundred thousand dollars. Without jurisdiction, you can't owe it. Number two, if they never, if you never received a notice of deficiency or a notice of determination, guess what? Another word for those two issues are: notice of deficiency, notice of determination. What's another? What's another name for that? Assessment. That's just no, a claim. No, a claim. A claim. You never, buy it. You never wait a second. You never got a claim. I've never given you a claim. You have no claim. You owe me forty-two thousand dollars. How can you owe forty-two thousand dollars without a claim? I never yeah. argue. I never make a claim. They said I owed forty two thousand. I might, but where's the claim? The, where's your proof of that? Once yeah. I do that, they don't know what to do with it. See, and then if worse comes to worse, you can always appeal it on the grounds they admit that they've never given me a claim. Now they're asking for forty two thousand dollars. I'm confused. See, yeah, that's a twelve B six failure to state a claim. Ah, ain't that something? I agree. Yep. I I agree with what they said. I agree. There's never been a claim. So without a claim, yep. how can I have a forty-two thousand? Stating a claim which would be can be granted is Rule Twelve B Six. Right. So if, okay, if you never stated a claim, okay, I'm not stating a claim. I will not state a claim. You owe me fifty dollars. How do you owe me fifty dollars if I don't have a claim? Okay, I'm a contractor. I do an estimate. After I'm done, I invoice it. There's your notice of deficiency, your notice of determination. There it is right there. There's my claim. See, in other words, if you don't owe it, how can you owe it if there's no claim? I agree with what you're saying. I never received a notice. See, then I go back to I never received a notice of deficiency, notice of determination, parentheses, the claim. As the court agreed with me, therefore, then you write your order, just like Smoking Baby says. And we write the order saying, since I never received a claim, <laughs> I can't owe 42000 or I can't owe whatever. So this must be dismissed on, for lack of jurisdiction on the grounds. I never received a claim for years 2000 to 2020, whatever. So we, you know, we just forget it. Go, oh, Kerry. <laughs> yep. Thank you, Kerry. Thank you. My pleasure. I hope you guys enjoy it. Thank you. Thanks, Kerry. Uh, the, next, pleasure. the next call will be the 23rd. And bring, and bring questions. Bye. Goodbye.